Hey everyone, welcome to Modern Day Debate. Tonight's topic is Christianity true? Um, we have two new faces for you guys, Max the Atheist uh, and Steve. And Steve's going to uh, start tonight's debate. So Steve, the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, so the question, of course, is, is Christianity true? And I'm taking the affirmative. And uh, we first better define what we're talking about when we say Christianity, because when I say Christianity, I'm not thinking of a particular branch of Christianity, like Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy or Protestantism. I'm thinking only of what all Christians agree with, and that is the claims of Jesus Christ. Christianity has become a religion, of course, uh, centuries after the disciples and Jesus had uh, been here. Uh, many things were added to it that I don't stand for necessarily, but the original definition of a Christian was a disciple of Jesus, and Jesus said, that if you continue in my words, you're my disciples indeed. So Christianity would be basically defined by the claims of Christ, the words of Christ, and uh, a person who's a Christian is one who adheres to those things. And I do. And uh, the question is, is this a fool's errand or is this something that is based on truth? Uh, so the real question comes down to, is Jesus who he said he was and who Christians say he was? And that's really the question I'm going to affirm, that he was, in fact. I'd like to start by stating that I believe I'm probably more skeptical in nature than Max is. And I'm, uh, I actually move on the principle uh, that Richard Dawkins presented in his book, uh, The Devil's Chaplain. And Richard Dawkins said, next time somebody tells you that something is true, why not say to them, what kind of evidence is there for that? And if they can't give you a good answer... I hope you'll think very carefully before you believe a word they say, end quote. And I, I plan to show you that there is evidence that Christianity is true. And I, I doubt that there's any evidence to be presented for the proposition that uh, Christianity is not true. And that's what I'm eager to find out from my opponent today, who is my friend Max, uh, the atheist. Um, okay, let's start by saying a, a separate question, not directly related to is Christianity true, but somewhat related, is, is Christianity good? Some people think it is not. And if it is true, that is, if Jesus is who he said he was, one would expect that Christianity would be good. And the people who follow it faithfully would be good for society, that Christianity would be good for humanity, since the Christian doctrine is that God loves humanity and sent Christ in order to teach us, you know, the ways that he intends us to be. And if we followed God's ways, we would expect that to be good for people. Now, the uh, Indian intellectual historian uh, Vishal Mangalwadi, I'm not really good at pronouncing, uh, uh, pronouncing that, in his book, uh, which is called The Book That Made Your World, documents very, uh, you know, completely the fact that Christianity is really at the root of all the things that Western civilization has introduced, including human rights, uh, the value of human life, uh, compassion for the sick, uh, actually education, universities were first started by Christian influence, uh, hospitals likewise and orphanages, uh, virtually everything of great value, women's rights, uh, the value of infants, uh, the abolition of slavery, all of those things are contributions to society that uh, Christianity made. Historically, that's demonstrable. And there's not really any serious question about that among historians. So Christianity is at least good. That doesn't mean it's true. But I want to say this, that not only do Christians say it's good, there are atheists that say it's good. For example, David Horowitz, who's a secular Jew, in his book recently, The Dark Agenda, pointed out that if uh, Western civilization gives up on Christianity, it'll be a very dark age that comes upon us because Christianity uh, is responsible for all the freedoms and the and the better things that we have always taken for granted. Uh, Tom Holland, who's also an atheist, in his book Dominion, How Christian Revolution Remade the World, basically said the same thing, that basically our ideas of human rights and the value of human individuals all came from Christianity. Uh, paganism did not have anything of it. And so he also is concerned that if the West would give up on Christianity, uh, the West would plunge into another dark period. Douglas Murray, another atheist, in uh, well, he, he basically believes that we need to work furiously to nail down an atheist version of the sanctity of the individual. He says, if we can't do that, 
we'll have to go back to Christianity because it provided us with one. So these are atheists that say this. And, and the most famous atheist of them all, Richard Dawkins, actually wrote uh, this. He said, quote, whether irrational or not, it does unfortunately seem plausible that if somebody sincerely believes God is watching his every move, he might be more likely to be good, end quote. And that comes from his book, Outgoing God. So uh, I just want to start out by saying Christianity is recognized not only by Christians, but by atheists to be something that's been good for society. That doesn't make it true, but if it is true, we would expect it to be good, and therefore that makes it uh, perhaps still in the running. I mean, if it was bad for people, then Christianity would be, uh, there's no argument to be made that God is its author. Now, how would we know if the Christian claims of Christ, the beliefs about Christ are true or not? Well, we have records. We have historical records. You know, belief in Christ is simply a historical question. Uh, there was a historical man named Jesus of Nazareth. He made certain claims. He did certain things. He died a certain way. And Christians have always believed that he rose from the dead. Um, if these things are true historically, then that goes a very long way to proving that Christianity is, in fact, true. If Jesus is who he claimed to be, if he rose from the dead, those are fairly strong evidences that he was not uh, lying or that those who spoke uh, about him were not lying about him. Now, how do we know if we have any records about this? Well, uh, you know, the skeptic and agnostic Bart Ehrman, who's one of the leading American scholars in the area of uh, New Testament uh, manuscripts, he made this statement. He said, quote, the oldest and best sources we have for knowing about the life of Jesus are the four Gospels of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is not simply the view of Christian historians who have a high opinion of the New Testament and its historical worth. It is the view of all serious historians of antiquity of every kind, from the committed evangelical Christians to the hardcore atheists, end quote. So Bart Ehrman, like everybody else who knows what they're talking about, knows that the four Gospels are the oldest and best records we have of who Jesus was. Now, of course, that doesn't mean they're true, but we now know where to look for the evidence. The best historical records we have are there. Now, as far as the truthfulness of these records, uh, I'm not making any assumptions about them being inspired. Some people say you can't use the Gospels because they're in the Bible, and the Bible's just, that's circular reasoning. You're accepting the Gospels because you accept the Bible, and you accept the Bible because you accept the Gospels. No, that's not true. No, the historical records were written separately. The Gospels were written at different times in different countries and were later collected into what we call the Bible because they were recognized to be true historical documents. They are not, uh, you know, there, there's no, no claim in the Gospels themselves that they are inspired, okay? Now, Christians often want to believe that they're inspired, and they're welcome to think that way. But whether they think that way or not, that is not a claim that the books make for themselves. What they do claim is that they're true. And when people claim to be telling a true story, especially multiple people independently telling the same story, uh, then you have some reason to take them seriously. You might doubt them for if there's good reason to doubt them, but if there's not, you basically, we have a habit of taking people seriously if they sincerely say that they saw something happen and they were there and they have a detailed account. Uh, you know, we, that's what, you know, news and uh, history and all those things are based on that kind of evidence. Uh, Dr. John Warwick Montgomery made this statement, quote, historical and literary scholarship continues to follow Aristotle's dictum that the benefit of the doubt is to be given to the document itself, not arrogated to, by the critic to himself. This means that one must listen to the claims of the document under analysis and not assume fraud or error unless the author disqualifies himself by contradictions or known factual ina inaccuracies. Careful comparison of the New Testament documents with inscriptions and other independent early evidence has, in the modern period, confirmed their primary claims. Now, in my opinion, one doesn't have to prove everything the Bible, the, the Gospels say to be true, if their primary claims are true. And the primary claims are confirmed in all four of the records. And the fact that they are historical is really the view of almost all historians today. Uh, there were doubts centuries ago because there hasn't been as much study and research and discovery in the Middle East. But, you know, the, the writers of the Gospels describe over 40 different uh, landmarks uh, in Israel, especially in Jerusalem, which nobody would know about 
if they lived there after 70 AD, or I should say if they didn't live there before 70 AD, all these things were totally destroyed by the Romans in AD 70 when the Jews were driven out and taken into captivity over, you know, to other countries. So, it, you know, the, the landmarks that archaeologists have found in Jerusalem that are mentioned in the Gospels make it, it's a very impressive case that these were written by someone who actually lived at that time, lived in that place, and claimed to see the things that they wrote about. So these are some of the important, you know, it's interesting, over 3,000 people are known to us, not from the Bible, but from secular archaeology, from that period of time in Palestine, from the first century. And over 500 names of 3,000 people are known to be common in that period. And what's interesting is that 41% of the people that are known from secular history bear the, the most popular nine names uh, of, of the many names that are known. And when you look at the New Testament, this, the same nine names are occupied, uh, they, they are applied to about 40-something percent of the people. It's almost exactly the same as we find in secular history. And yet, when you look at the documents uh, in the false gospels of the Gnostics in the second century, they don't have the same names at all. They have names that aren't found in ar archaeology at all. They make up names. Likewise, even in the first century, Jews in other countries didn't have these names. What's interesting is Simon, for example, and Joseph were the most uh, common names at the time. And those are also the most common names in the New Testament. Mary was the most common female name. And there's a lot of Marys in the New Testament. Certainly, it's the most common female name in the New Testament. These are just accidental or incidental confirmations that the writers uh, were telling truths that you would either have to know from being there, or you'd have to do a great deal of research to know these kinds of things. These are just like almost accidental confirmations that they were there and that their stories are true. Um, now, a question we have to ask is, did Jesus work miracles? This is one of the things that make people doubt the Gospels. In fact, no one would doubt the Gospels at all if there were no miracles in them, uh, because the historical evidence for them being true is superior to this uh, confirmation for almost any other ancient historical documents around. It's only because there are miracles in it that many people doubt it. And of course, this, this uh, doubting of miracles is simply a prejudice. It's an assumption that supernatural things have never occurred and therefore could not have happened on those occasions. That assumption is the basis of a worldview. It's not the basis of any demonstration from science. Science has never demonstrated that miracles cannot occur. Uh, and if there are miracles, the best evidence we'd have for that would be people who saw them just like any other historical event. In that sense, we have four witnesses in writing from the period to the resurrection of Jesus and to many other miracles of his. The Gospels record, of course, a lot of miracles that he did. And unless we have just a, an a priori uh, bigotry against the supernatural, which is not a rational position to take, uh, well, then we have no reason to doubt that these miracles are true. And another question we'd have to ask, and perhaps the uh, last one is, well, it's not necessarily the last one, but I don't know if I have much time for more. Um, I guess we have a we have seven minutes. That's good. So I will take two more points. One of them is, did Jesus fulfill Old Testament prophecy? Uh, if Jesus was the Messiah, he would have to fulfill prophecies that God made in the Old Testament through prophets hundreds of years before his birth. And uh, while many Christians claim that Jesus fulfilled 300 Old Testament prophecies in his lifetime, I think that is somewhat inflated. I don't believe there are 300 prophecies. My study of the Bible does not yield that result. However, uh, just at the top of my head, I could pull 25 uh, prophecies out of the Old Testament, which were fulfilled by Jesus. And these had to do with the timing of his coming, including the approximate year that the Old Testament prophets uh, said he'd come, uh, the place where he would come, where he'd be born, where he'd minister, where he would die. These are all prophesied as well. Um, there's, um, you know, uh, prophecies about what he would do, how he would die actually is is prophesied and that he would be vindicated and the, and the results of his vindication on the world are prophesied too and these things happened and the truth is there's just no one in history that fulfilled these 25 is actually pretty many if there's hundreds all the better but i don't want to argue for hundreds 25 would be more than enough uh in other words all the major things that jesus did that are recorded by the witnesses have been uh, you know, were, uh, were prophesied, and uh, and he fulfilled that. 
Now, the last question I need to talk about is, of course, the resurrection of Jesus, <clears throat> because it's the resurrection of Jesus that would be the final uh, evidence that he is who he said he was, because he predicted he'd rise. Now, people have risen besides Jesus. I mean, people have come back to life who had been clinically dead. Obviously, that happens in hospitals, not infrequently. That's not necessarily a miracle, though it might be. That's not the point. The point is that Jesus predicted that he would die a certain way, that he would be dead for a certain length of time, and that he would rise and uh, appear to his disciples again afterwards. Now, those are things that the disciples themselves say happened, and they didn't expect them to happen. When he died, they thought all was lost. They did not believe that he was going to be rising from that. It didn't even cross their mind until they found the tomb empty. And they, uh, and of course, eventually saw him with their own eyes and touched him and so forth. They didn't have a hallucination. They ate with him. They touched him. Now, as far as the empty tomb is concerned, <clears throat> That is an easily verified historical fact because everybody knows that Jesus lived and died, that he was buried as well as well established in historical records, and that his tomb was empty three days later cannot be avoided by the fact that if it was not, then the enemies of Christianity, who were many and vociferous, would have gone to the tomb and found his body and said, look, you guys who say he's risen from the dead, he's right here. You know, what are you talking about? The fact that the enemies of Christianity were never able to discover his body when the uh, when the Christians began to teach that he'd risen from the dead suggests that the body was no longer accessible. It was not, therefore, in the tomb anymore. We can deduce the tomb was empty, though there might be many theories as to how it became empty. The Christian view is that the same Jesus that the apostles saw alive afterward uh, rose from the dead and walked out of the tomb. Uh, the other options are that some human beings removed him to the tomb. Now, the enemies of Christ, whether the Romans or the Jews, would have no motive to do that. And if they had done it, they would have every motive to reveal that they had done that as soon as they wanted to discredit Christianity. The disciples, I suppose, might be said to have had, had motive, though it's, it's really difficult to know what their motive would be. Uh, they were not men interested in starting a religion. They were fishermen and tax collectors and peasants who had no religious training and no religious ambitions. Uh, and they were actually, they went back to fishing initially after he died. Uh, there's no reason to believe that, left. Thank you. There's no reason to believe that they would wish to uh, fabricate a story. Uh, there was nothing to be gained for them. Even if we say, oh, well, they got to be the leaders of a great religion. It was not a great religion at first. It was a persecuted religion. The leaders were the ones who got hunted down and fed to the lions, burned at the stake, and so forth. And any one of these disciples could have avoided that had they reneged and retracted their statements under torture. There are many Christians, besides the apostles, were tortured, and many were killed because of their testimony. Um, and on occasion, some people had reneged, but no one who ever had seen Jesus reneged. There were people who believed on the basis of the apostles' testimony. I was debating an atheist once on another podcast years ago, and I said that the apostles died for their testimony. And the atheist said, well, lots of people will die for their beliefs. But I said, it's not their beliefs, whatever, it's what their testimony was. They were eyewitnesses. They said, I saw him, I touched him, we walked with him, he spoke with us, we had conversations with him after he rose. And were, they were willing to die for what they saw and heard and knew. That's different than what you believe. And uh, so if we want to say the disciples were the ones who stole the body, and no one else can be imagined who'd have a motive for doing that and keeping it concealed, then they were pretty sincere. And it's interesting, you know, uh, con artists don't really make very good martyrs, generally speaking. Uh, if a person really has perpetrated a hoax, uh, there's usually a limit how far he'll go in perpetrating it, especially under torture and facing the death sentence. And uh, the disciples, they went all the way. They went all the way to their death, and did as did many other Christians who had seen Jesus. So that's my basic presentation. I'm sure we'll have challenges on some of those points, and we'll be able to discuss them later on. But this is my basic reason for arguing that Jesus, uh, that Christianity is true. Basically, we have historical records dating from that very period. Uh, they meant some of them are eyewitness accounts. Uh, Jesus uh, is recorded to have done miracles, his resurrection from the dead was not a, a strange thing compared to the rest of his miracles. He actually raised other people from the dead during his lifetime. And he also fulfilled prophecies about the Messiah. Now, these may not prove beyond question to a skeptic that Christianity is true, 
but I would have to see much better evidence presented that it is not before I would give up a position that has good evidence for it. All right. Thank you very much, Steve. Before I let Max take the floor, I just want to let everyone know this is Modern Day Debate, a neutral platform for topics like religion, science, and politics. Our vision to provide a neutral platform so everyone has a fair shot. Um, and we maintain that, and that's why we do this every well, a couple times a week at this stage. It's going great. Uh, we have over 178,000 subscribers, which is uh, incredible. That amount of support uh, definitely motivates us to keep us going. Now, before, real quick, before I let Max take over, um, just so everyone knows, we've got a slightly different outline for tonight. Um, we're allowing our debaters 20 minutes each for openers. They're then going to have timed rebuttals, um, followed by more timed rebuttals. But there will be an open discussion portion. So um, there will be that. So be ready for that. And then, of course, the usual Q&A section. So you can start getting those Super Chats in now. Just a warning, um, I only guarantee Super Chats over $5 being read. This is not to say that uh, Super Chats under 5 won't get read, but um, with the amount of Super Chats we get lately, uh, that's something we're, we're having to do now so that we don't sit here for... Um, Three hours extra with our debaters just answering questions. Um, also, real quick, just going to mention this. Last time I moderated, I wanted to stay after the debate and hang out with you guys for a few minutes. Um, and then something happened, the stream malfunctioned, and it just shut down on me. So we're going to do that today, and I'm going to be gifting 20 Modern Day Debate memberships during that portion. And if you guys want to get to know me a little better, um, I've got something to share with you guys. So uh, with that, Max, uh, your first 20 minutes opening statement starts now. The floor is yours. Take it away. Thank you, Justin. Am I, am I audible? You're totally audible. Excellent. Well, thank you so much to Modern Day Debate. And Steve, thank you for agreeing to this and to suggesting this format. Uh, I don't think it'll take too long to debunk Christianity. Uh, as the music man says, let's start from the beginning. It's a very good place to start. Steve agrees in some sense as he begins his statement of faith from his website, thenarrowpath.com, highly recommend, with a citation from Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We read on further in Genesis to discover a tale which is not supported by any objective, religiously inert evidence. The subsequent mythology cannot verifiably answer the question of where we come from. It yields no insights into observable, testable, and predictive cosmology, chemistry, physics, or biology. Not what one would expect from a religion professing itself as the ultimate pathway to God's grace. You may hear my opponent obfuscate and wax eloquent for what has generated hours upon hours of biblically informed, sometimes rather long-winded responses to extremely niche questions of certain theological idiosyncrasies. And the confusion from his audience arises from this. Christianity is the idea that a talking snake whispered in the ear of the first woman who was made fully formed from the rib of her common law husband, who himself was formed from a planet and solar system and ecosystem made by a God in six days. You throw in a planetary flood, a sort of hitting the reset button by this allegedly all knowing, all powerful, a superior being or set of three beings, depending on who you ask. There's the Tower of Babel, Babel, some wandering in the desert across a rather small geographic area. Slavery, as Steve mentioned, child sacrifice, all in setting the stage for a vicarious redemption of your personal offenses to this God by way of execution and subsequent resurrection of a virgin's heretic child who is in fact the Jewish Messiah and the Son of God and the Christ like some Herculean knockoff. My opponent may try to discredit my characterization of the faith. However, I proffer here that the interpretations of the accounts of Genesis are not merely an obscure distinction and disagreement amongst brethren, but rather a fundamental component to the theology of Christianity itself. To accept Christianity is to accept that these fables are true. The fifth chapter of Romans goes on about how Sin entered the world through one man, and thus death through sin, and thus death came to all people through sin. It goes on to cite the reign of death from Adam to Moses, and cites Adam as the pattern of one to come. 
Very important to remember the Bible's emphasis having provided a lineage from Adam to Moses, by the way. It's very clear that at least Paul believed in the literal interpretation of the narratives of the Genesis account and believed it to be historically evident and cites it as a theological basis for the necessity of the blood sacrifice of the Son of God to God the Father. So in asking the question, is Christianity true? We are confronted with the subsequent question of who is Christ? Accepting that these gospel accords are the earliest, although certainly not contemporaneous, accounts of the Jesus of Nazareth figure, we are presented with not only a narrative line of persons, but with the chronology of these persons with remarkable lifespans of centuries each, as documented in the early chapters of Genesis. In addition to being the son of God, the source material also provides us a list of who Jesus is human, at least on Mary's side, since he's born of a virgin, of who Jesus' human ancestors were documented to have been. The genealogy of Christ is provided in the Bible, even when accounted for in the most charitable way for contradictions between the two lineage presented in the Gospels, still only adds up to far less than 5,000 years from Adam to Joseph and Mary. And this is not some fringe numerological interpretation of trying to see or determine what 666 really means. By the way, we all know 666 is really Ronald Wilson Reagan. The Bible gives not the dates, but the lifespans of Jesus's ancestors. These are the boring bits of Genesis and Luke that discuss Adam begat Seth, who begat Enosh, etc. And it gives these stupendous lifespans of centuries each for these early few. Again, truly remarkable, given the fact that they would have been utterly, totally inbred due to numerical necessity, let's say. It would have been a very close and very big family indeed. A Bishop James Usher of Ireland, a Catholic theologian in the early 1600s, added up the dates presented in the scriptures. He determined the biblical math yielded a sum of creation of 4,004 BC, aging the planet Earth today at about 6,000 years old today. He similarly placed Noah's flood, a global catastrophe in which the entirety of the planet was submerged with water for an entire year after a 40-day rain event around the year 2350 BC suggesting that there should be a planetary evidence of such an event dating to around 4,400 years ago, 4,500 years ago. Now, the numbers differ slightly from the different versions and interpretations of the Septuagint, the Masoretic texts, and mutually exclusive interpretations on how to assess those versions. But taking the outer edge, the oldest available, it still just adds up to 6,000 years old roundabouts. That would mean all of history, all the formation of the seas and the continents, trees, animals, dinosaurs, the ice age, life, the world. It all occurred within the last 600 decades, according to Christianity. My opponent often undermines atheism as a newfangled intrusion onto the philosophical stage. I don't see how we could have come any sooner, nor at a better time by his calendar. Hebrews 11.7, the writer of Hebrews, still anonymous, still scripture, uses the historical allegory of the flood as a warning. 2 Peter 3.5 as well discusses how once the world was destroyed by water, but soon it would be destroyed by fire. I wonder at what point, by the way, will climate change become so unbearable a scourge that even Christianity will interpret it as a real, albeit a sign of the times only. The theologies derived from these ancient Judaic myths can be evaluated not only on their own face, but on the face of their source materials, which coincidentally describe the creation of the earth and, dare I say it, genesis of the human race. In other words, we can investigate the narrative witness of the Christian scriptures against something we can also objectively evaluate. See how well the two testimonies jive next to the facts. Now remember that Jesus of Nazareth and Saul of Tarsus, Paul, are at least culturally Jewish, having studied and been immersed in the teachings of the Torah as interpreted in their time. Why would a resurrection be necessary? Because it fulfills the ancient law. It provides the sacrifice of Abraham's son up to God. It closes the loop. It has a very clever poetic chiasmus in this regard. But not only did the New Testament disciples and apostles refer back to the global flood of Noah as fact, Isaiah does as well in 
Isaiah is a heavy one because so many of the prophecies alleged to have been fulfilled by the Jesus character originate in the book of Isaiah. Jesus as well is recorded to have cited the first two chapters of Genesis when questioned about marriage and divorce, somewhat rather graphically when he says in Matthew 19 that the creator made the male and female and that the two shall become one flesh. It is, of course, evident that not only are there more than two sexes, that not all species on this blue earth get it on in exactly the same way we do, but that the biological distinction between male and female human animals is a recent evolutionary invention indeed, in the true historical scale of the world. The same passage of Genesis that Jesus cites goes on to say that in the image of God, he created him, strongly implying that this God too must share 99% of its DNA with chimpanzees and bonobos, since it is our DNA itself which provides us this fine shape and structure. Uh, Jesus goes on, same gospel account, we've only covered the first one here of Matthew, refers to the flood of Noah in the 24th chapter. Right after prophesying that no stone would be left unturned or the Jewish temple uh, didn't happen, by the way, the very foundation of the temple remains in the form of a retaining wall, which we widely know today as the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall in central Jerusalem. Jesus reportedly says that as it was in the days of Noah, so too it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. That people were eating, drinking, making merry, and were totally oblivious until the day the flood came and took them away. Whereas if one were to say that if the teachings of Christ were true, therefore Christianity must be true, then following the premise, we have to test whether the teachings of Christ were true. Again, being charitable in our understanding that these gospel teachings are understood not to be contemporaneously written. To accept for a moment that in a crowd of 5,000 people, for instance, in ancient Palestine, there were not only just a handful of bread and fish amongst them, but that nobody remembered to bring along a pad and paper or a tablet and stylus or a papyrus and reed, whatever could be used to write down what the man had to say. Getting past even that, granting away that, we still might expect a divine account to at least update us on the error of the previous revelation, or at least the transmission of its revelation, copying errors in the finer dates and details of prior oral tradition. Given that there is no evidence to be found of a global flood covering the highest mountains by several feet, as well as a genetic bottleneck of all people on earth from the eight family members of Noah, after beaching in the mountains of Ararat less than 5,000 years ago, why would the Christ, the Messiah, then cite that story as an example of a historical fact? Better question, how did he cite it? He cites it from the book of Genesis, which, of course, was the sacred religious text of his time and place. He seems to have known no better than those who preceded him in this regard, and on a point only as so subtle as to deal with the origins of the human race itself. Why would I say Christianity is false? Why would I reject the divinity of Jesus? Because he evidently did not deliver any kind of reformation or updating of the narratives of creation accounts in the Old Testament in abject error as they are, nor did he ensure a way to comprehensively secure his teachings and guidance for the rest of us. Put another way, it's not a qualitative issue I take with Christianity. It is a quantitative one. The timeline simply does not add up. It's not an emotional or moral value of the teachings of Christianity, which is the topic for debate here, by the way. It's not, is Christianity good? It is the veracity of Christianity itself. We haven't even gotten to the miracles. We're just doing the background check on the guy. If you're smart, before you bring someone into a job interview, you run a background check. You call the references. That way, when you interview that person, you can determine whether they are fully truthful or not. Well, we can't interview Jesus in a way that these gospel writers annotate that they did, or at least experienced people who spoke with Jesus directly. Those same gospel writers are providing a set of dates and names that we can check against the facts. That is so critical to bear in mind, especially when evaluating a prophecy claim, as I'm sure we'll get to. A quick overview of the Tower of Babel story from Genesis proffers an origin for the many languages upon the earth. How did we get so many languages and so many people across so far and wide across the world in so short a time? Again, a few thousand years. Ah, it must have been that God interceded in the building of a tower from 
baked bricks and tar for mortar, as recorded in Genesis. I'll give you the NIV here. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their languages so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from all over the earth and they stopped building the city. And that's why it's called Babel, Babel, because that's where the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Again, referencing the timeline as provided by the scripture itself, we deduce that the scattering occurred around 4,200 years ago, 4,200 years ago, a century or two after the flood of Noah that ravaged the entire planet. We're provided no mechanism for this scattering, and given the most charitable allowance of a miraculous teleportation of these people to the far reaches of the planet, linguistics, archaeology, genetics, all are decidedly not in favor of such a model. For we know where languages come from and how they evolve. Similar, we know where the human race comes from, geographically not from present-day Iraq, but from deep within Africa. And we know when we left and settled down in different places across the globe. I say we know, and that is to say we are knowing. The dates of human occupation of the planet seem to keep being pushed further, not towards a Garden of Eden 6,000 years ago, but towards the deep past, as one would expect from finding more evidence in places where one was not previously looking, nor knowing what to look for. What we must do now is test to verify that there are outside sources that show that Adam, the first man, according to the scriptures of Christianity, did indeed live at the time of the creation of Earth some 6,000 years ago, and as the first human being to walk the Earth. Similarly, we can do the same for the declaration of Noah's global flood. Not only will investigating and verifying this hypothesis assist us in evaluating the learnedness and knowledgeability of the gospel writers, but it conveniently places us at the start of Christian scripture, an account of the world in the beginning. From this investigation, we may discover not just as atheists, but as living organisms on this planet, where the world came from, how old it is. We can ascertain from the rocks and processes in place the major events that occurred deep within our planet's history. And we can verifiably, without a doubt, place the origin of the world well before the dates recorded in the Christian scriptures. Because the Christian scriptures are the de facto source of Christian declarations, by testing the veracity, the truthiness of these scriptures from multiple angles, we can verify whether Christianity is true or not. Not only are we only very recently able to age the earth, we are only also very recently able to age the extent of the observed universe. The Christian scriptures have been totally usurped by the advent of the scientific method as a means of understanding the world. It is no surprise that atheism appears as such a recently adopted phenomenon, since the physical means of investigating the world through the telescope, the microscope, particle accelerators, probes landing on Mars, all are indecently late mechanisms of discovery and inquiry. And with each advance obtained by the atheistic method, the license to ask questions that religions such as Christianity have hitherto had a monopoly by force on the answers to, the value and credibility of religion wanes ever less. Christianity has had round about 2,000 years to deliver on the promises it claims to deliver on, healing, the driving out of demons, the gift of tongues, prophecy, and for two millennia, Christians have been grasping at straws to reliably manifest any of these amongst their own adherents until the advent and proliferation of the objective, atheistic, scientific method, until human minds were unshackled and liberated from the weighted chains of religious dogma. In other words, until atheism, which as my opponent rightly notes is a relatively modern philosophy, was adopted far and wide, the promises of Christianity were withheld. Say again? That's three minutes left. Three minutes? The promises of Christianity were withheld from utilization by the human race. The gift of healing is exponentially delivered by way of atheism. Anatomy works across all religious upbringings and persuasions. The day we switched from prayer to penicillin and cure what ails us, that's demonstrated that. Uh, demons have been associated and treated once identified as just schizophrenia or bad funguses, bad mushrooms or, you know, brain tumors, anything like that. The gift of tongues, that's even now liberated. Computer science, relying not on God, 
has totally been able to allow for instantaneous transcription and translation of the spoken word of most languages. The curse of the Tower of Babel is broken, or rather it is breaking as we speak to each other across this distance. Let's see, let's get down here to some good stuff. I'm, I overwrote for 20 minutes. All right. You think that God made flesh to walk amongst us would be good enough to prevent such misguided apostasies, that it wouldn't have been like the debacle between God and Moses at the pronouncement of the Ten Commandments. You think that the teachings of Jesus and the Canaanized mainstream gospels would suffice at that. But in the classic Jewish tradition of providing auxiliary religious commentary, such as comprises the book of the Talmud, we have to believe that the only historical reason we even think about Christianity is the same reason most of us don't think about Zoroastrianism, because the victor writes the history. It is for this reason that we must really care only about Christianity as a society than we same way that we do about any other extinct Bronze Age cult. One must be willing to remember what people are willing to say, willing to do, willing to believe if they're a member of a cult. I mean, this is evidenced by the Branch Davidians dying for what they believed in, the uh, Kool-Aid kegger down in Jonestown, Heaven's Gate with the sneakers. People will die for what they witness to be true. So Steve's point about martyrdom is, is totally null and void on that point. How much time do I have left? I think I'll donate the rest of it to our questions and answers at the end there. Okay, yeah. Uh, you had about 40 seconds left, but sounds good All right, good well, me. then let me say this in, in summary. Right. Always bear in mind that something that requires a salesman is likely something that shouldn't be bought. If something is true, it's true because it works. And I'm going to be exploring that theme as well throughout the Coast Guard debate tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Max. All right, everyone, once again, welcome to Modern Day Debate. If you're just getting here, we've got Max debating Steve on Is Christianity True? Uh, so far, so good. We just finished our opening statements. Um, and we've got over 750 live viewers right now, which is fantastic, but only about 100 likes. Now, normally I'd be like, hit that like button, but you know what? I don't want you to do that yet. I want all you guys to hover the like button right now, okay? Because what we're going to do is we're going to go into 10-minute rebuttals, uh, which means Steve's going to go first with 10 minutes, and then Max is going to go again uh, for 10 minutes. And if either one of our debates debaters say something you like, show your support to them with that like button. All right. Uh, and with that, Steve, 10 minute rebuttal. It's all yours. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you, Max, for your presentation. You know, Max, um, like I said, I, I like the skepticism uh, principle that Richard Dawkins said. If somebody tells you something is true, say what evidence is there for that? If they can't give you a good answer, I hope you'll think carefully before you believe a word they say. I gave you some reasons why, uh, which could be considered to be evidence that the gospel records are historically accurate, which of course has been the, the view of people of, uh, of many centuries, of, uh, including very foolish people and some very brilliant people. It's not as if you know one kind of person has believed this, it's those who look at the evidence and those who simply take a fair-minded approach to historical records and say, unless I find something that is untrue, and I see these witnesses to be sincere, then I, I have no reason to dis, uh, disregard them. We, we take all historical writing that way or news reports that way. Now, uh, Max, you didn't really address uh, the matter of whether Christianity is true. You spent most of your time, at the beginning at least, talking about Genesis chapters 1 through 11. Now, whatever I may think about Genesis chapter 1 through 11, it's not directly related to whether Christianity is true. Uh, because actually... Over 60% of people in America who call themselves Christians and believe in Christianity do not believe that Genesis 1 through 11 is historically accurate. Now, many do, but it's obviously not an essential part of being a Christian to have a, a literal view of Genesis 1 through 11. So to spend time debunking that may be fun and might be an interesting debate to have at another time, but it's not addressing the question of whether Christianity is true. Christianity is not found in Genesis chapter 1 through 11. Um, now, you mentioned Jesus believed in Adam and Eve, uh, or at least he believed that God made man and woman. That's what Jesus said, and that he ordained marriage. Now, you didn't prove that that isn't true. He didn't say how long ago it happened. Jesus didn't give any dates about that. He just simply said that there are two genders that God made, and he also instituted marriage. Uh, he also said there was a flood. 
He didn't say if it was a global flood or not. There's been many floods and many people have been killed in floods. Uh, whether I believe in a global flood or not is not relevant to whether I believe in Christianity. But of course, you you mostly ridiculed those things rather than proving them wrong. So in other words, you took the typical atheist approach of using mockery rather than evidence. So you haven't presented it. Of course, you didn't have time. I don't blame you, but you wasted time talking about things that are not relevant to our debate topic. The question is, are the Gospels true? Is Jesus who they say he is? Did he do the things and say the things that are recorded? Did he rise from the dead? Those are the issues that really determine whether Christianity is true. Now, if Jesus believed in uh, a you know a six thousand year old Earth today, uh, and Adam and Eve created four thousand BC, uh, we don't know. We know that he believed that man and woman are the two sexes that God made, and I don't think anyone has ever disproven that. Uh, we Jesus did say that God created marriage between the sexes, and I don't, I don't know if anyone could disprove that. And he said there was a flood in the days of Noah, and I don't know that anyone could ever disprove that. He didn't say whether it was global or not. He didn't say when it happened. So uh, most of your arguments had to do with dates and uh, likelihoods that certain things happened, that, but no evidence has been proven that, A, those chapters in Genesis are not historically true, or B, even if they are not, that that would have any impact on Christianity, since some 60 some odd percent of Christians in America do not believe those stories are historical, and they believe they're uh, legendary or something else like that. But they're still Christians. So obviously to attack those things does not really touch the essence of what the beliefs of being make a person a Christian are. And those beliefs have to do with the man, Jesus Christ. That he's the son of God, of course, is a matter of faith, but it's based on historical uh, proofs and evidences of things that were seen and, and witnessed and, and uh, reliably recorded about him. And uh, that he rose from the dead is considered by Christians to be the, you know, that which seals the deal. That he predicted he'd rise from the dead on the third day, third day and he did, uh, is pretty much where Christians uh, derive their view that Christianity is true. And now, if you can prove that he didn't do that, that's okay. Well, I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear that. But I, you haven't really attempted to do that. What you've tried to do is actually to uh, kind of just, you know, ridicule uh, things that you say Christians believe. But many of the things you ridiculed are not believed by all Christians. Uh, they are believed by some Christians, but there's quite a variety of beliefs among Christians. Like I said at the beginning, I'm not here to defend one denomination of Christians. I'm not here to defend Catholic or Protestant or Orthodox Christians. I'm not here to discuss whether those who believe in Calvinism or those who believe in Arminism are true, uh, whether those who believe in Reformed theology or dispensationalism are true. Those are not the issues we're debating. We're, we're, we're talking about is Christianity true? And Christianity, as I said at the very beginning, is Jesus himself. Christianity is acceptance of Christ's claims and continuing to live in the embrace of their truthfulness. And is, uh, frankly, unless someone can show that Christ's claims are not true, then, then all the evidence seems to be in favor. Now, what I find is that the arguments of atheists do not ever provide any evidence that these things are not true. What they do attempt to do, and I assume Max will do this in our cross-examinations later, uh, what atheists often do is say, well, the evidence that Christians use is not convincing to me. It's not good enough. Well, okay. Everyone's entitled to make their own assessment of the evidence. However, if one wants to argue that Christianity is not true, that Jesus is not who he said he was, and he did not rise from the dead, I have yet to hear any atheist actually make a case that provides actual evidence and, and something other than ridicule. Now, the ridicule actually comes from this, a difference of worldviews. Atheists are materialists, naturalists in their worldview. Now, worldview is the grid through which you see everything, the paradigm that you look at the world through. It tells you where we came from, uh, what matters, what, what values are, uh, what moral uh, codes should be followed, if any, uh, you know, what the meaning of life is, what the purpose of life is. Uh, what exists and what does not exist. These are the uh, aspects of a worldview. Christians hold to a, an open-minded worldview. They believe there is a natural world and they're open to a supernatural world if there's convincing evidence that it exists. And Christians believe that evidence does it, it is there. Atheists are not open-minded. They are uh, they're naturalistic. 
they do not allow for a supernatural realm to exist. Now they can say, well, I didn't, you can say, well, I, I've never heard anyone speak in tongues or, or heal the sick or raise the dead. So I don't believe there's a supernatural realm. But the Bible doesn't tell us that if the supernatural realm is true, that you will have seen these things. Uh, miracles are not said to be commonplace in the Bible. There's only three periods of time, usually about 40 years, approximately one generation each, where there were a plethora of miracles recorded in the Bible, and there were centuries and centuries in between them, millennia in between them, in fact. So the average person in the Bible did not see any miracles, and the Bible doesn't teach that they should have. Miracles are not commonplace, but to say they never happened requires that we know far more than we can prove. And since the majority of humanity throughout history has believed that they have seen supernatural things, whether it's you know, the activity of demons or of God, uh, you know, of course, Christians don't accept every report that people give, but the Christian is at least open-minded about the possibility of a supernatural realm that exists and might intrude in some measure into our world too. Uh, atheism simply ridicules that, but on no basis, because the, the naturalistic worldview has not been proven. It's simply an assumption. It's simply a, a ruling out uh, prior to investigation and without seconds. evidence uh, of whether there is or is not uh, a God, a supernatural realm. And, uh, you know, if, if there could be one, then there could be miracles, obviously. Uh, and if there could be miracles, then everything that is said about Jesus could actually be true. And therefore, to suggest that there are no miracles requires that we prove there's no God. And that is, of course, something that the proving of a uh, universal negative is, is actually an impossibility. So anyway, uh, there's a lot of time spent in Max's presentation uh, debunking things in Genesis. And I'm here to say I'd like to hear what arguments there are to prove that Christianity is not true. Thank All you. right. Thank you very much, Steve. Okay, we are halfway through our first set of rebuttals, folks. Um, Max, you're next. So, guys, if you hear anything you like, hit that like button. Max, the floor is all yours. Keep smashing at that like button at this point, guys. So, yeah, Steve addressed several things. Uh, quoted, I believe it was Dawkins, etc. Uh, one thing he said is that 60% or so, I believe, was his figure of Christians in America today are still Christians, but reject this idea of a earth that's only 6,000 years old. And there's a reason that 60% of Americans reject that reason. It's because the evidence has caused them to reject it. They have edited out that part of the narrative of their understanding of how the world was because prior to the evidence being discovered, again, very recently from the atheistic, uh, naturalistic, uh, scientific method, prior to that, people did believe that the earth was 6,000 years old. Again, since at least the 1600s when James Usher calculated it. And so uh, the fact that Steve's offering saying that, well, the majority of Christians don't even believe that, that's really not very good evidence just because the majority believes it. Similarly, I think he said that the majority of people believe in the supernatural. Again, not great. You're appealing to a majority fallacy there and saying that, well, we took a poll, family feud style, and people say God, they believe in God. You wanted a little naturalistic explanation, I think, of why people believe in God. Fortunately, I prepared one. Uh, if we are, as, as many of the faithful tell us, that we're just molecules in motion, why do we all have this intrinsically deep-seated belief in the all-powerful divine presence of the Almighty? It's a simple reason. Our species evolved it as a means of escaping predators and evading danger. Take, for instance... You're uh, early proto-human, uh, some prehistoric watering hole, and you, you're taking a drink when you see in here that there's a rustling in the leaves next to you. It catches your attention. Is it the wind? Probably. In which case, you could just keep drinking water and not have to worry about it. Is it a lion ready to pounce? Possibly. In which case, you should really take notice of it and get out of there. If it's a lion, you might be eaten. And thus it's going to lower your likelihood of passing along the genes of your relaxed disposition. So over the gener excuse me, over the generations, we have evolved from the traumatized paranoid survivors where it pays to heed a false positive to assume that there is a hand behind the rustling in those leaves, that shadow on the wall. 
complications in anthropology created the first superstition, then ritual, and then thereafter it combined the myths and legends uh, from actual history in large part, just hyperbolized from it. And it's no surprise that the human race has evolved not only a system of religious thought and supernatural proclivity, uh, but that the psychological and sociological mechanisms by which to embrace it so fully are, you know, evolved there as well. Let's see, uh, you wanted to know uh, about evidence, the, the, the sort of the, you sort of kind of got at the burden of proof. Again, the burden of proof for Christianity, I, I just took it from the beginning, okay? I, I assume Christianity is based in the Christian scriptures, okay? So I just started at verse one. You did the same thing in your statement of faith on the website, thenarrowpath.com. And so I sort of assume that Christianity is going to be rooted from the get-go in the scriptures. And I just start reading from the beginning, okay? Now, I get it. You're saying that a lot of people don't take that literally. Fine. I'll just start beginning I'll just start reading at the beginning of the Gospels in, in Matthew and Luke with, with these genealogies. They provide names. It provides a list of names for who Jesus is. We have to evaluate, is Jesus who he says he was? Is Jesus who the Gospels say they were? We can look at the names that are presented in the Gospels, take them at their word. There are, those names are also associated with like the reign of kings, like the, the length of years of the reign of kings. All these numbers are in there. All I'm doing, all I did to debunk Christianity was make a timeline. Just make a timeline. Because if the timeline of Christianity, if the narrative of Christianity works out, the first person, Adam, is going to be 6,000 years ago in the Garden of Eden. Then there's going to be evidence of a global flood. There's going to be evidence of all these things. I mean, what you're saying is that you're allowing to not take literally certain passages of the Bible and to take other passages literally. And, and that's fine. But I showed you in my opening where even in the New Testament, the writers and theologians of the New Testament, all they believed in the literal interpretation of the old texts, of the old stories and Genesis and so forth. They cite them as fact. OK, and, and they also cite them as prophecy and like in Isaiah and the, Isaiah even refers to a flood and there would be evidence of a flood. There would be evidence of a global flood that occurred. There would be evidence of of of, of like a genetic bottlenecking of all people just down to like a family of eight. How did they how did they all interbreed? Like, how did they all that they, they'd all be crossbred? It's from the same family. It just doesn't work. I just have like chronological issues with Christianity. I have just genetic issues with Christianity. Why is it that we're so similar in DNA to other primates, like apes and bonobos and stuff like that? Like it just, the claims that Christianity make don't necessarily provide as, as resilient an answer to the questions writ large about the world in the same way that naturalistic science does. And naturalistic science, you mentioned goodness. Is Christianity good? Naturalistic science has enabled all sorts of awesome stuff to happen. And it's largely because that we've, rather than saying, well, we already know the answer to such and such a question because we have scripture, we have faith, we have our stories, we begin to question them. And sometimes we just discover something, we observe something that totally blows our minds about what we believed about the world before, our worldview, which is a word Christian love to use. And so it really is no surprise that atheism, all these things, it's, it's, it seems recent because for a very long time, we were just bound by these mythologies because we just didn't know, Steve. We just had no idea that fossils were down there in the way and the amount that they are. We had no idea about seafloor spreading and what the bottom of the ocean really looked like. We had no idea about plate tectonics. We had no idea about how the tides worked or solar eclipses. We thought solar eclipses were crazy omens. Now we can predict them. So really the value of atheistic science, rather than saying something that happens, it must just be a miracle or must just be a word of God. The second that we shift our attribution of the, the actor, the immovable mover behind that into some kind of natural law, we're able to not only apply that natural law and our benefit and things like engineering, but we're able to use that natural law to assuage our fears about things that happen, like a plague or a, or a, you know, a wildfire or something. So it really is psychologically better than two, since you brought up, is it good or not? 
uh, as far as is it true or not, we have a methodology, an atheistic methodology, rather than relying on scriptures for our basis of how to question the world, whether trying to make the world fit our narrative for scriptures, we have an atheistic methodology which allows us to make a hypothesis, test it, create experiment, reproduce that experiment. We have peer review, which is not great. It's frankly, peer review can a lot of times just be the, uh, the fallacy of the majority. But the point is, is that it's reproducible. So when people reproduce a prediction or they reproduce a, 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 a model of how something will happen, for instance, like TikTok, a lot of people said, where's, where's the transitional form from a fish to a land animal? Well, we thought that it should be somewhere in the Devonian layer of rocks. We went to a Devonian layer of rocks and we found it. It's called TikTok. So our way of understanding, rather than relying on scriptures or faith or Christianity, Christianity is not true because our way is. I suppose in closing, seconds. that would be my way. Yeah. Christianity is not true because atheism is. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I heard. I thought I heard that I was closing up there. No, I, you had 90 seconds. That's what I was saying. Oh, great! I'll donate the rest of my 90 seconds of question okay. time. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, all right. So our first set of rebuttals is over. With that, thank you so much, gentlemen. Uh, we got one final set of five-minute rebuttals to go. Just to let everybody know, in case you did not know, um, Modern Day Debate has a Discord with over 4,000 active members. And I am going to drop that in the chat right now to link it to you guys from you hooligan. And uh, if you think you got what it takes to debate, um, or if you're suddenly inspired to defend your position, um, feel free to come over to the Discord anytime. And there's usually a lively debate on some topic over there. Uh, and with that, we will go into our final and second rebuttals, five minutes apiece. Um, and we'll start with Steve. And then right from there, we'll go into open discussions with Q&A coming up quickly after that, folks. So get those super chats in. Uh, Steve, the floor is yours. You're muted, Steve. Steve, you're muted. Sorry about that. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so Max said that um, I made some kind of a epistemological mistake by talking about what the majority of people believe. He gave two examples. One is I said that the majority of Christians don't believe that Genesis 1 through 11 is historical. Now, I wasn't saying they were right. I'm saying this proves that whether it's historical or not doesn't impact whether Christianity is true because Christians can believe it is or not. That's not, that's simply a definition of Christianity. You're making your own definitions of Christianity because you know what you want to refute, but I'm, I'm a Christian. I know what Christianity is and I, uh, and I know what I believe. And I know what most Christians believe because I've been talking with Christians for 50-something years, and I know not all Christians believe what you think Christianity is. Now, you also said that I mentioned that the majority of people throughout history have believed and thought they had some uh, evidence and interaction with supernatural things. I don't credit them all. I told you that. But I'm saying that it was a universal belief among humans until modern times that there is a supernatural and, and a great number of uh, well-educated modern people still believe that there's a supernatural. Not all of them are Christians. Some Christian, um, all, almost all Christians believe that, but many people who are not Christians believe that too. So, I mean, uh, that's that's not an appeal to the majority. It's simply saying that the atheist is a very tiny minority that probably ought to be expected to bear the burden of proof if he wants to show that there is nothing, that everyone has been wrong. That's fine. Now, you said your final statement was Christianity is not true because atheism is. Well, you've done nothing to prove that atheism is. You've uh, talked about evolution. You've talked about the flood. Well, what if you're right about those things? Does that prove there's no God? Uh, I don't think it does. I mean, God God could exist, and all the things you said could be true, too. Now, we could debate evolution sometime or some other issues from the Old Testament, if you'd like, but that's not what we're talking about here today. You have not done anything to prove that the Gospels are not reliable histories of Christ. Now, you did mention that the uh, genealogies uh, seem to confirm the Old Testament genealogies. And they do seem to do that. And that would suggest very strongly that Matthew and Luke, who give those genealogies, did accept those genealogies as true. But that's not, we don't depend on their opinions about the past. We're talking about their opinions about Jesus, okay? Now, again, if you're trying to argue that the Gospels are not inspired 
And if they were, they couldn't make long statements about genealogies. Well, then I'm not going to fight you about that because I said I don't have an opinion about whether the Gospels are inspired. They don't claim to be inspired. What they claim to be is true stories written by people who spent time with Jesus or with his closest friends in some cases, and that they have a valuable, accurate record of who he was, essentially what he said and did, and especially of his death and resurrection. And, uh, you know, if they had some views I don't hold, that's fine, too. Uh, if they have some views I may hold and you don't, that's all right, too. We're not really concerned about their views. We're concerned about their testimony. And, of course, neither Matthew or Luke could testify about how many generations there were from Adam to Christ. They could give lists that were current in their day, and they may or may not be correct lists. But if they're not, they were simply following the, what their, the lists of their day that they copied from said. But to give that kind of information is not the same thing as to testify to events that they saw with their own eyes. So, again, we're talking here a very different kind of evidence. Now, um, you said that, well, science is good. Well, yes, science can be good. It's not all good, of course. I mean, science can make viruses that wipe out people uh, and atomic weapons that wipe out people, all kinds of things like that. And, uh, you know, that happens. Uh, but the point is, Six the reason modern, the reason modern science exists at all is because the earliest uh, adventurers in science, pioneers in science, were believing that the world was rational and could be understood and could be explored. They believed there were natural laws. Other religions, paganism before them, did not believe this. It was the Christian worldview that caused many Christian scientists to branch uh, off into scientific studies, such as we benefit from today. Certainly many Christian, uh, many uh, scientists today are not Christians, but the whole scientific enterprise was launched by people who were, and who, and, and frankly, there's still a great number of uh, professional scientists who, who are Christians. So, I mean, it doesn't, there's no, uh, there's no reason to say, well, science is good, therefore Christianity is wrong. Okay, science can be good, it can be bad, but whatever benefits have come from it, we can thank Christianity for that too. All right, thank you, Steve. Um, just to let everybody know and to remind them all in the chat, the chat is here for you guys. Okay, we got almost 800 viewers. We got over 800 viewers. Um, but I'm going to ask the chat to follow our debaters' examples um, and, and keep your comments respectful towards each other, all right? The conversation is always exciting to have, um, but attack the topic and not the person, okay? Um, Max, your final five-minute rebuttal is all yours. So Steve has uh, tried to, I think, shift the burden of proof from his side to our side, from Christianity to atheism. I think he said because atheism is so recent and such a minority that therefore we have to have the burden of proof. That's not how the way the burden of proof works. In fact, the whole reason Steve went first in this debate is because he is arguing that yes, Christianity is true. And then he would offer up his reasons for why that is so. I then offer up my reasons for, okay, I'll look at your facts and evidence presented. I'll analyze them by say, making just a timeline for the facts and dates presented in the Bible as they are presented and not just trying to explain them away as, well, some people believe these, some people don't. I understand that. What I'm using is I'm using the source material the Bible, not necessarily just as accepted in Christianity as later scriptures from the New Testament, but the scriptures that were accepted by Christianity at the time of Christ. And again, I've showed you that Jesus believed they were true, the writers of Hebrews, Paul, writer of Second Peter, they all believed that it was true and literal. Okay, so for one thing that I understand that there are Christians who don't believe it's true. They don't believe it's true because there is overwhelming evidence in the opposite direction of the fact that Adam did not exist as the first human 6,000 years ago. And that's that's a theological basis because if it opens the door in this way, Steve, because if people don't believe that Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden and that Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, there is no need for a resurrection there. I mean, why do we need a, a sacrifice and resurrection of Messiah in the first place? Because the sin entered the world. The Bible says sin entered sin and, and death entered the world through one man, through Adam. That's what it says. It's, it's, it's in there. It's in the evidence you presented. You presented it because it's the burden of proof. You're presenting, I mean, it's, it's, it's the Bible. The scriptures are there as a burden of proof evidence for the veracity of Christianity. I'm analyzing that evidence. I'm taking you at its word. I'm saying that, yes, these people... Uh, spoke to Jesus and great, but I'm just going through it from, from start 
to finish, which is a very logical thing to do. And immediately, right at the get-go, right at the start, there are things that just don't make sense. They just don't add up. There's no evidence for a flood that, it, as described in the book of Genesis, it, it, we don't see that. So that's rather disappointing and not something that we would expect as from a historically reliable, divinely, not necessarily inspired, I don't think you argued for that, but a historically reliable source, you think that there would be corroborating evidence with that. The burden of proof, again, needs to be demonstrated by the party who says that such a thing is true, right? You have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Well, it's doubtful that Jesus is who he said he was because the genealogy provided doesn't add up. The whole reason that that genealogy is in there is because he needs to descend from the line of David or what have you in order to fulfill a prophecy. Okay, that's fine. But the dates don't add up because it places that genealogy. It starts that genealogy 6,000 years ago in the Garden of Eden as the first person was created six days after the formation of the universe. There's not evidence that corroborates that. Quite the opposite. I'm not going to address whether the science is good or not because, again, it's not a question of whether science is good or not. I will say that it is more useful. It's more useful in healing it's more useful in communication and, and speaking of tongues, which we're not supposed to even be able to do, but which I can do with anybody through my smartphone and Google Translate. I can that, That's been lifted. God has not intervened in the stopping of any more buildings since then. You didn't argue that he would, but it just seems, it just seems odd. And uh, yeah, I think I want to get into the open discussion here. Okay. I was just Go about to it. ring you for 60 seconds left, so... Um, yeah, we can get right into the, to the open discussion. So um, with that, just to remind everybody that we have a 30-minute open discussion coming up now um, with five-minute closing statements still to follow after that, and then we'll get into our Q&A. So if you have a question for our uh, debaters, um, feel free to send in Super Chats. Um, earlier, I had mentioned that we only guarantee Super Chats of $5 or more will be read. Right now, the certain level, the the level of super chats that I have available. If you just um, had two dollars to to donate, we'd have time for your super chat. Just to let everybody know, it's and well worth it. Now. Yeah. Um. With that, let's get into the open discussion. So, gentlemen, the floor belongs to you. Good luck. Okay, uh, Max. Could I respond to something you just said? You Please. said if there's no Adam and Eve then there's no need for the resurrection. I think by that you mean no, no need for the, the uh, crucifixion and the atonement. Um, why? Because it, it, the, the need for that starts in the Garden of Eden. Because well, it, if, the, if Adam had, if the narrative of the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve and a talking snake had never happened, then we would all still be, well, I, allegedly we all would still be living in the garden of eden and there'd be no need for a resurrection and crucifixion and sacrifice of a child to their own parent and so forth well we don't have any cases in the bible of a sacrifice of a child to their own parent and i don't uh, to me the beginning it's, it's the called god the son and to god the father so that would be the child of the to the parent well, actually actually the bible says that god was in christ offering himself up for us so i mean it's a different thing than offering your child when you offer yourself and that's what the Bible teaches. Of course, you don't understand the, the incarnation. I don't expect you to. That's a, a complex Christian doctrine, but you're not understanding it, and therefore you're misrepresenting it. The Bible does not teach that— Why God don't you represent it? Okay, I will. That uh, The Bible does not teach that God took someone other than himself, his son, and killed him. It says that God became man himself. That man is called the son of God because God also existed outside of that manifestation. God was bigger than just that man, but that was God stepping into our world, and he is called the Son of God for that reason, but it is God offering himself. The Bible says God was in Christ uh, reconciling the world to himself. So uh, this is that's not, not what you're. That's contrary to what your statement of belief here says, which I have up, and you say in your second point, quote, I believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the Word made flesh and is thus uniquely the Son of God. Right. That's well, that's not that's what the Bible says. The word made flesh. The Bible says the word was God. Okay. You said so, that God was in Christ. Not you didn't say anything about the word made flesh. I don't think you said the words word or flesh. 
you know, if we want to talk about that, we can use many scriptures and many terms. I, In my statement of faith, I'm quoting from John chapter 1, which said that the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and then it says the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's exactly what I said earlier in different words. So it's not a different comment, it's not a different uh, concept. It's simply Just something said different that, words. Yeah, yeah, you can say many the same thing in many different words, and the Bible does. Many, many theology uh, points are made in... Can in you various... say things in different numbers? Um, no. I mean, I don't know what you mean by that. How could you Well, say... here's what I mean by that, is that I understand that there's room for interpretation when it comes to words or parables or allegories or so forth, but the numbers, the quantities, the integers given in the Bible all say, when added up, that the earth is 6,000 years old. It's not stated expressly, nor is the doctrine of the Trinity. But the numbers add up to say that the world is 6,000 years old. That's what the okay. Bible says. If we want to talk about the evidence for Genesis sometime. We'll do that. This, this debate is about, is Christianity true? And that has nothing to do with that. So um, Yes, it does, Steve. Well, you think it does. And, and you're not a Christian. So let the Christians tell you what Christianity stands for. Okay? And you can make, you can make up your own ideas about what you think Christianity should stand for. But Christians okay. are the ones. Did the scriptures say that the earth is 6,000 years old or not? No. Oh, so those numbers that are in there, they don't add up to that. Uh, well, it depends on how you take them. There, You know, where it says so-and-so. Oh, so the, the numbers oh, are up to interpretation. Do you want an answer? Do you want an answer? I do. I'm just saying that the numbers are up to interpretation. When it says that, when it says that Adam became, was 900 or 130 years old and he got set, and Seth was so many years old, and he begot his offspring. And then he, the word begot means became the father of, or in Hebrew terminology, became the ancestor of. And therefore, each of those names could be clans uh, that, that are given. And many Christians believe that. Many, many Bible scholars believe that. That we're not talking about, you know, that's the number of years between one man and another man. But between the beginning of one clan and the beginning of another clan, each of those clans could have gone a lot longer. Uh, than we have any record of. The Bible is not making a commitment about the age of the earth. Uh, it's true. People have interpreted it as if it is, but that's you, you can't force it to make that statement. And I know that your I know your whole argument depends on making uh, Genesis look ridiculous. But my whole purpose in being here is to say the records about Jesus are reliable, and therefore we have every reason to believe that he did and said what is recorded. Now you said something I wanted to comment on too. You said, we atheists have a better method of knowing things. We don't trust in scriptures. You mean sacred scriptures. I'm sure you do believe in writings. The word scripture is simply graphe in the Greek means writings. What do you I'm mean sure believe in? What do you mean believe in writings? Well, you're the one who used the term. You said, we don't, uh, you said we don't base things on scriptures. You would base them on science. So let me ask you this. What scientific uh, uh, repeatable experiment do you use to decide who the first president of the United States was? Mm, what scientific, historical, repeatable thing would I use to determine what the president of the United States was? Mm -hmm. Well, there are, well, or none. There for, are one none thing, for one thing, there's Mount Vernon. Question. That's not a scientific question. That's a historical question. History... Oh, okay. History is known to us not from. I guess you didn't. I guess you didn't want my method for testing whether George Washington was president. Well, or not. I, you were. You seem to be uh, balking. Go ahead, give it to me. Well, I wanted to give you a, a good answer that's consistent and makes sense. For one thing, there's a house. For one thing, he's buried there. Uh, I mean, we could go dig him up. I actually remember seeing him on an eighth grade school trip to D.C. So we could go crack oh. open the old boy sarcophagus oh. and was test his DNA. Was he uh, resurrected from the dead when you were a kid? You saw. Was him? he resurrected? Gee. He Say again. You said you saw him when you were a child. Yeah, yeah I saw his 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 uh, tomb, George Washington's oh, tomb. Okay. Well, but but to find a tomb doesn't tell you whether the man in it was a president of the United States or not. No, no but a body is a good indication. No, a body is not an indication of whether a man's a president or not. A it's body an indication is... that he existed. Oh, I have no doubt that he existed, and and I don't doubt he was present. But to say that a man existed is different than saying. He was president, and you can do no laboratory experiments to discover whether he was president. You have to get that, as we do all historical events, from historical records, and that's how we know about Jesus. You don't go into a laboratory and decide whether Jesus exists or not, do you? Uh, can you think of an experiment you could do to decide that? 
or whether he's the son of God? What, what experience? Uh, no, and here's here's where we we start to to spiral a bit. So historical evidence, I agree with you. And again, I accepted the historical accounts offered by the Gospels as as facts. All I did was try to put them in a timeline. Okay. And then not only do I have to accept the historical gospel accounts as facts, but then I also have to accept the Old Testament because the New Testament refers to the Old Testament so much. Plus a lot of the prophecy provided in the New Testament that's fulfilled is from the Old Testament. So I take the Bible writ large, okay? That's what I have to evaluate, all right? And when I start evaluating that, even just focus in on the question of Jesus, I have to say to myself, okay, well, how would I know George Washington is president? For one thing, he has lots of living uh, common descendants and, and has lots of great, great grandchildren, what have you. So I could, I could run that test and take a look at their lineages and their family tree. All right. I think that's part of the reason why the gospel accounts even include a lineage. I'm talking a lot. I think that's part of the reason why the gospel accounts even include a lineage in their openings is to prove that Jesus is who he says he is, that Jesus is fulfilling these old prophecies from the line of David and so forth. And I think that once you try to just put those things on a timeline and add them up, it all comes to the logical conclusion that the Bible is making the proclamation that the world is 6,000 years old. I want to address for a moment your uh, gaps or clans, names being clans theory. Okay. You have to understand as well that not all of those names, though that list of names is very clearly going to be pointing in the direction of individuals because for one thing, it refers to Enoch who lived, what, 365 years and then God took him up. Not quite a resurrection, but just a, you know, rapture or what have you. So yeah, I mean, it, it, it clearly refers to those people as individuals. Also, many of the names in the Matthew, or is it Luke, in the gospel accords, the lineages, they're list listed as kings with uh, reigns. Excuse me. Sorry, find some here. They are listed as kings with reigns, and those reigns are given numbers of years. And that's not a a clan that's just a it's presented as a historical fact as a right. timeline first of all i would trust bible scholars who know what the hebrew means better than you and to say that that those names are the names of individuals like enoch you have they, no idea how much hebrew i know or don't know by the way steve uh well i know how much expertise you have in the bible by the way you represent things in the bible so but and i do spend frankly most of my time reading people who are scholars that doesn't make me an expert but I don't think you spend that much time doing so. If you do, fine. Here's what I'm saying, is that the men that are named may be the founders of clans. Enoch could be the founder of a clan. When he was a certain age, I think 300 years old, he became the father of Methuselah. That is, it could mean the Methuselah clan. And therefore, you know, it doesn't tell us how long that clan existed uh, before it died out and, it's, and the next clan came along or, or took over. But the point I want to make is this. The the timeline that you're trying to get out of the Gospels, you, you can't... The timeline that's in the Gospels. I'm not trying to get them out of there. They're in there. I have to deal with hey, them. Listen to me if you would, because you don't know what you're talking about. The Gospels do... Ad hominem, ad hominem, fallacious. The Gospels do give a list of names. It follows the names of Genesis 1 through 11, copied from Genesis 1 through 11, but then it gets into the story of Abraham. And, and then when it gets to David, of course, David was only a thousand years before Christ, and there's not a reason in the world to doubt that those kings reigned in the order that they are given. Uh, no historian I know doubts it, and there's been plenty of uh, secular monuments that have found to confirm those kings' existence. So, so if, you, if you say it doesn't fit the timeline, you're saying, well, Jesus has to be from David. Well, David existed, and there's no problem with the time between David's time and Jesus' time, nor the the time from Jesus' time to now. When we talk about Christianity, again, we're not talking about Genesis 1 through 11. You are. I'm not. I'm talking about Christ. And the Gospels are have every credibility in saying that Jesus descended from David. Uh, we we have no reason to believe there are extra generations between uh, you know, kings. Although, by the way, Matthew himself knowingly leaves out a few generations of kings. There's about four of the kings he leaves out to, to make it uh, shorter. And, uh, of course, he knew that anyone could test that out just by reading the books of Kings and Chronicles, which they had. Um, so in other words, they do leave out generations sometimes, but they, uh, we don't have any reason to believe that that would be, uh, that they're making the time too short. And that's your argument, that the time is too short. 
not between David and Jesus. It's not. It's it's a perfectly realistic uh, genealogy. No, the time is too short from Adam to David. Right, but that that most of that is Genesis one through eleven, which, as I said, whatever I may believe about that, many Christians believe as you do about it that it's not true. What do you that, believe about that? That's not what I'm here to talk about. We could debate that someday. Oh. But uh, what I'm here to talk about is Jesus, and you haven't shown me any evidence that the evidence that the records about Jesus are not reliable. Or that I have shown not- you that the genealogy in the record of Jesus, as presented, not with this ancillary, uh, you know, gaps or naming of clans or whatever, as presented, taken at face value, they appear to summarize that. Jesus descended from David. David descended from Adam. Adam was the first person in the world, and he walked the earth 6,000 years ago. Okay, I told you that what the gospel records say about history, especially um, pre-Abrahamic history, which is Genesis 1 through 11, uh, is not relevant to what they say Jesus said or did, because they weren't there. Why is it in there? Why is If it's not relevant, why is it in the Bible? Because they accepted it. I accept it too, by the way. Right. But the point is, that's not the issue here. The issue is, did they report accurately about Jesus? You want to, you want to. No, they didn't. Because they. On point. But I, we're here to debate one point. We could debate dozens of things we disagree about. That's not what this debate is about. It's about one thing. Is mm-hmm. Jesus who he said he was? And are the records we have about him reliable? If you want to say they're not, I'd like to see the evidence. I would say, okay, I'll offer you the evidence. I'll offer you the evidence of why Adam was not the first person 6,000 years ago. That has nothing to do with whether the records of Jesus are accurate or not. The records of Jesus imply that he is descended from Adam. Do they not? Matter if, it doesn't matter. to we, We're all descended from Adam in that in that case. But the point is, who is Jesus? Now, you said, if Adam's not true then, you know, we, we don't need Jesus to die for our sins. And you said... The it, Bible it, says that. No, it doesn't. No, you're thinking of Romans chapter 5. It does not say that. That's how Augustine interpreted it, and the church followed it afterwards. You simply need to know that the Bible doesn't say everything that Augustine said, that the church followed. The Western church, Catholic and Protestants, followed Augustine very closely. I don't. But the, I follow the Bible more closely. But the point I'm saying is... Oh, that, oh, oh, oh. what other source material did Augustine use for that for deriving that theology. You said you followed the Bible. What was Augustine following? He was following Neoplatonism. He is a Manichaean. He was a reforming, he was a re, uh, recovering Manichaean. And okay. and those who came from Manichaeanism, yeah. And they so, relied on stuff other than the Bible? They weren't Christians. They were, they were oh. Gnostics. Yeah, they were Gnostics. And so, uh, you know, Augustine blended a fair number of Gnostic ideas into Christianity, and he became the most influential Western church father. Catholics and Protestants followed him rather slavishly and you and, said that he was wrong and you're right well i don't agree with him i guess that would say i think he was wrong but the point is and you think uh, you're right on, on on a point of contention with his theology you think you're right and he's wrong i do yeah hmm. and one reason i do is because he it. didn't know the greek he didn't know the greek new testament he only read the latin therefore he was uh he, some of his interpretations especially in john five uh, excuse me romans five the very point you're talking about he was moving from the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate, and he himself said he didn't read Greek. But the Greek text actually says something different than what he thought, and therefore he made a false conclusion. But the point I'm making is this. You said that the need for Jesus' uh, atonement goes back to Adam. Not for me, it doesn't. For me, it goes back to my beginning, when I was born. I sinned. Because I sinned, I need an atonement. Because you sinned, you need an atonement. It, it, what Adam did is not relevant to, to the need for Jesus, frankly. So you don't believe in the doctrine of original sin, meaning that we're all this inherited birthright of sinfulness derived from our original progenitor, Adam? I don't believe we were born with the guilt of Adam on us, no. I do believe we were born with a a propensity towards selfishness. I don't think anyone could argue against that. Uh, So, I mean, if that's what you want to call original sin, I I could say I believe in that. Is that, is the doctrine of original sin the majority opinion held in Christendom today? In Western Christianity, yeah, not the Eastern Church necessarily. Yeah. Okay. So one way that we could say to ourselves, is Christianity true, is we could try to test the claims and the doctrines generated by each sect of Christianity. 
And one reason that it proves that it's not true is because they each use their, sometimes they use their own methodology, sometimes they use a different methodology, but they each get these different conclusions all the time. It's not very reliable as far as producing something that's testable. And I understand that you think that testability is not necessarily a sign of veracity, but it's certainly a utilitarian handy thing to have. Well, and atheism addresses questions like where did the world come from? You know, why are we here? Things like that, that the big questions which Christianity tries to answer as well, really all religions try to answer. We have a testable method. One of the reasons why Christianity can't be true is because it's unfalsifiable as far as theologies go. Everybody uses the same source material, uh, but people have derived completely different uh, conclusions from it. Science, atheism is self-correcting. Naturalism is self-correcting because if we can't repeat it, if we can't cite it, we don't write it. Really? So can you make, uh, can you create life? Not yet. Okay. So the, so you shouldn't believe that it can be created. So I say again. You said if we don't, if we can't prove it, we don't write it. So right. you shouldn't, you shouldn't agree that life was, came into existence, right? We, we have life existing right now, so we can we can yeah. test you, that you, and we can that. prove that. You have that as a historical and psychological phenomenon, not as a scientific one, because you don't what have... What the hell are you talking about? If you give me a chance, and don't know I'll give you a chance. Well, if you'd be more out. succinct, perhaps. Well, I'm not being less succinct than yourself. Now, let me have a few minutes to speak if I could. You said that science doesn't believe anything that it can't prove in a laboratory. They can't prove that that life can be produced from non-life in a laboratory. Can't be done. Now, not yet, I said. Right, which means you can't at this point. Not and, yet, but we have a very good idea of how we do it. You know, and we're working on it right now. Me, oh, I know. I've read a lot about it. You know, let me say this: if scientists can someday create life in a in a laboratory, will that prove that there's no God? Will it prove that that happened naturally? Or will it simply prove that it requires intelligent design to do it, since that's what scientists are bringing to the test? It would depend that it, it would mean that it could happen naturally, because we're we're we're. It's not as if we're reproducing this in some uh, isolated system. Like we are part of the natural world. We're interacting with the natural world. Our experiments are naturalistic, and we're trying to determine how does life happen. Not only that, but we find the components of life aminos and, and tholins and car they're called carbohydrates, organic molecules way out there in space. And we, we, we find the ingredients for life. How did it happen? It, it probably happened here on earth because we are in the right orbit for water to exist as a liquid on the surface. That certainly seems to help. All right. I was just challenging your point that you said, we don't say it if we can't demonstrate it. Okay. You mm -hmm. can't, you cannot demonstrate that you hope to, that's a matter yes, of faith. Can. No, that's a faith thing for you. You can't demonstrate that life can come from non-life. You hope it can, and you hope someday to prove it. And, you know, that's a faith statement until you... I don't, I don't know if I use the word hope. I mean, I, we, we hope to. We want to be able to do that, though, certainly. We have a methodology of how to do it. We know how to go about performing that experiment. Christianity does not seem to have an agreed-upon method to verify whether or not whose interpretations are true or not. Because well, you say that you're true, but you go up against the majority of Western Christianity, as you said. And then the other guy, the St. Augustine guy, he's the majority of Christianity. Earlier, you appealed to the majority where you said, well, 60% of Christians reject the idea of a young earth, or that 90% of people in the world believe in some kind of superstition. So you seem to rely on the majority opinion when it favors your position and reject well, the majority no, opinion I, when no, it I, disagrees with your you. niche interpretation of scripture. I give statistics when they, when they undermine a false claim. When you claim that believing in a literal uh, Genesis 1 through 11 is the foundation of Christianity, and I say, well, no, the majority of Christians don't believe in it, so it's not the foundation of their faith. It's the then, scriptural foundation of Christianity. It's at the beginning of the Bible. The Bible is the book for Christianity. No, it's atheism, in there. I'm not, I'm not obfuscating by atheist, pulling in something irrelevant. It's nuance. in there. Atheists hate nuance, but, you know, Bible scholars realize- I like nuance apparently better than you do, that there are different At ways. Hominem. No, I'm saying that there are better ways, there are, let's just say, different ways to interpret that material. You're assuming there's only one. 
Well, if you assume there's only one, you have, you're not very well read about the subject. And I'm, that's not ad hominem. Can all of the ways to interpretation, can all of the interpretations of scriptures be wrong, but only one be right? Are they not all mutually exclusive? They are. And no. so to say, how do we find the right interpretation of scripture? No one's presented that methodology or ability. You want scientists to prove that life can arise spontaneously if given the right you know, ingredients and setting and so forth. We can do that. We know how to be able to do that. Science is okay. pretty young and Christianity is pretty old. And you, for, I mean, Christianity has failed to provide methodologies to reliably find a real truth or a real doctrine because well, they haven't done it yet. They've had plenty of time to try it, but they I haven't done it yet. They haven't I'm agreed on a methodology. My right. way, atheism has a way of doing that. And we do things like build bridges and cure diseases and put people on the moon. Okay, uh, your your way has a way of proving that there is a God or is not a God. Is that correct? Uh, my way has a, my way, this is a key point. Thank you for bringing it up. My way has a way of testing whether the claims made about that God, I can't test whether there's a God or not, but I can test whether a God made a global flood all over the earth by looking for evidence of a global flood all over the earth. Very and different there question. isn't any. Okay, so are you an atheist or an agnostic? I have not yet heard any convincing. I am, a, I am an atheist of the Christian God, just in the same way you're an atheist of like the Norse God. I say the God as described in Christianity in the Bible cannot exist. Well, your, your disbelief in God is not comparable to my disbelief in the Norse gods, since nobody believes in the Norse gods anymore, because... Again, appealing to a majority, or lack of oh, one. Doesn't matter. I mean, nobody believes it because modern uh, belief has outgrown it. People can't go and find the Norse gods. They can find Christ, and, they can, and people do. People do Really? Where is he? Where is he well, buried? Well, that's... So the Shroud of Turin? His no 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 his his tomb is empty and that's an important point. Listen, oh, so you, we can't find Christ. You make too many points at a time before I get a chance to respond. Let me respond to something uh, that you said earlier. You said that Christianity is flawed because there's different interpretations of it. Well, I mean, on the I mean, different don't methodologies. Me. I actually preferred that you wouldn't interrupt me at this point. But there are different views about. Uh, about evolution too, frankly. I mean, not all are Darwinists anymore, but many are. Uh, there were the punctuated equilibrianists and so forth. There's different views about Darwinism. That doesn't mean it isn't true, but it means that if it is, it's possible to have different interpretations of the data. Now, when it comes to Christianity, where, where the Christian denominations differ from each other is not on the fact of Jesus Christ. And that's the historical fact. What they disagree about is on philosophical questions of how one interprets certain passages that are about esoteric things, like the origin of sin or something that cannot be tested. There's, those are opinions. Those are opinions only. And uh, so what we're discussing here, I, I'd like to remind you, is the historical question. Is Jesus who he said he was? And once we decide that, we, we'd actually have a ground point to discuss some of those other points. But uh, you're not really helping me there to figure that out. Is there proof that Jesus existed, or, or I should say did not exist, or that he was not who he said he was? That's the point you're making. There is proof that Jesus was not who his biographers said he was, because his biographers provide a lineage, an ancestor, an ancestry that is factually very, very, very much in contrast with the Dodging evidence we find for the lineage of the rest of history. The well, rest of history. You, let me tell you this. Matthew doesn't do that. Matthew only takes the lineage back to Abraham. Okay? okay, so let's say we don't take Luke's version. Let's take Matthew's version only. I'd be happy to ignore one of the four Gospels. I think if we ignore one of the four, surely we'll get to ignore all four of them eventually. But go ahead and keep going. Well, no, that's actually uh, irrelevant because most of the things in Luke are also found in Mark and in Matthew, and none of, uh, but not the not the genealogy back to Adam. Okay, so if you don't like Luke's genealogy for whatever reason. We'll just keep that out of the discussion. Let's talk about Matthew's genealogy. It takes the ancestry of Jesus back to Abraham through David. Is that something you want to disprove? You you just say, let's keep that out of the discussion. It's in the discussion, man. It's in the Bible. It's there. We have to face it. Okay. I don't know your... how you're going to say you can just ignore it or ignore oh, the here's, Genesis here's 1 through 11. Problem. Your problem is you don't know much about how to evaluate the evidence. Of ad this. hominem. Ad hominem. Make well, an argument, not a fallacy. 
Give me a moment and I will. Okay, you're taking the four Gospels to be Scripture, and therefore, if, if anything in them can be found wrong, uh, you know, the whole thesis that they are what they are is thrown out. I said, we don't have to have a question about whether they're uh, Scripture. They are ancient historical records, okay? Now, ancient historical records need to be taken in their own right unless they can be disproved. And you haven't disproved any of them. Now, if you, if you want to disprove Luke on the basis that he believed in Adam, well, you can do that. That leaves three records that were independently written that are independent witnesses that historians can look at to see whether Jesus is who he said or not. That's the question we're discussing. We're not discussing whether the Bible's true. We're discussing whether the historical records give us a, an accurate picture or not. The historical records are the Bible. When you say historical records, you're referring to the Bible, right? No, that's not true. Not true. No, the, the okay. historical records are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts. Those are the historical records of the New Testament. Which are in the Bible, right? They are now. They weren't when they were written. They were written as ancient individual historical documents. That's You can't blame them if somebody later collected them and put them in, in between leather covers. That's That doesn't discredit them. You're only finding fault because you're assuming that in the Bible means inspired by God. And therefore, if you can find anything in the Bible that's not inspired by God, you can't, can't accept any of it. I'm that's saying anything in the Bible is the scriptural basis for the doctrine of Christianity. Okay, well, let's not talk about the scriptural basis for the doctrine. I'm not using the scriptural basis. I'm using the historical oh, basis. Oh, you're not using the his. Okay, oh, wait, hold on. I, I need to understand here. You're not using the scriptural basis for Christianity. The Gospels are part of Scripture. Now, the, gospel, the Gospels are a part of Scripture now, yes. If they had never been put there, they'd still exist, and I could use them still. It's okay, a, it, great. So you'll still use the Gospels then, because you're counting the Gospels as both scriptural evidence? It's an accident of history that they got gathered into a collection and are now in what they call the Bible. They okay. each have their own independent credentials, and if the, if the Bible had never been collected, they would still exist as records to be reckoned with, and let's reckon with them. Great. Let's do that. But you're saying that without using the scriptural records, you want to use the historical records, right. which you call the gospel records, which are in the scripture records. You will say you want to ignore the scripture records and only use the historical records, but okay. you're just calling one thing. I'm willing to take... Do you see the loop that you're making there? No, I don't think you see the loop you're making. I'm willing to take for the sake of <laughs> argument. I'm willing to allow for the sake of argument that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not part of scripture. Okay. That's your whole objection to them, apparently, is that they're part of Scripture. Well, for a long time, they were not. Do you know how long it took to put the New Testament together? It wasn't put together in its present form until almost 400 AD. So for the first 350 years after Christ, these documents were independent historical documents floating around, and they had to be reckoned with, and we need to reckon with them that way, too. You know, if somebody would take all the historical records of American history and put them in one volume and say, this is Scripture now, that wouldn't be an argument for rejecting all the history, uh, j just because you'd find some problems in one of them or something. Say, oh, well, that's scripture. Listen, I'm not appealing to scripture. These books are in the scriptures, but that's irrelevant to my argument. I'll leave it to the audience to interpret what Steve made. That just makes absolutely no sense, because he just said, I'm not appealing to scriptures. He's appealing to historical documents. The ones he have named are in the scriptures. The reason why they're, I mean, they're, and, and then he goes on to say, well, let's just ignore the genealogy of Luke, if you like, or the genealogy of Matthew. And, and then at the same time, he says, well, we have to reckon with them as historical documents. And yet right. at the same time, he chooses not to reckon with them. So, oh, I, I mean, it, it's a really shaky foundation, I must say. You're not listening very carefully. Let, well, listen gentlemen, to ad hominem. that brings us to the end of our open discussion, however. Um, that was that was a race to the finish there. <laughs> <laughs> Really, really uh, fascinating, interesting stuff. Great discussion. Who has Excellent more job. likes? Is are you able to ascertain that? Who has more likes? No, we're not. We're not keeping nope. score. Not like oh, that. Man. No, I was um, just creating a game out of it in order to encourage likes. Um, but we've got room for a lot more in general. So if anybody hasn't hit that like button, uh, the, the the like button's right there. It's not too far away. Just give it a quick little click, and uh, we'll know that you're listening. And that you like what you're hearing and what and what you're seeing. Um, with that, we're about to go into our uh, closing statements with these gentlemen. We're going to give them five minutes each, um, and then we'll go into our Q and A. So, if anybody has a super chat in mind and has a question for our debaters, now is a good time to get that in there. 
And I'll remind everyone after the Q&A, and I uh, relieve these fine gentlemen from the floor, I'll be coming back uh, to hang out, share some information about Modern Day Debate, myself personally, um, and answer any questions you may have. So don't go anywhere because I'm also going to gift uh, 20 free Modern Day Debate memberships from my own pocket. So hit that like button. Um, who would like to, uh, I forget, I apologize. Who is going to go first for closing? I think we'll let Max go last because I think he'd like to. It's usually the advantageous position. So I'll go first. All right. I was Steve. actually going to offer up my uh, closing argument just to five extra minutes of question time. Okay. Oh, so, okay. Steve, are you just happy to just go I ahead and like, do a closing like statement to, and then we'll go right into Q&A? I would like to make a closing statement. All right. Um, Max, I'll allow you the right to take back those five minutes if you want to respond to his closing statement. I reserve my time. I reserve my time. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Steve. The floor is all yours. Okay. Uh, well, if you've been paying attention, you've noticed that um, what we're supposed to be talking about here is the question of, is Christianity true? Which I defined at the beginning as, is Christ who he claimed to be or not? That's, that's all that Christianity was at the beginning. That's all it needs to be ever considered to be. Although in the centuries that followed, several religions develop out of it, which I don't make any claim to adherence to. I'm talking about whether Jesus is who he said he was or not, and that is to be known really only from historical documents. I've told you we have four generally understood to be reliable historical documents, and they give every evidence of being true. Uh, it would seem that when you have any historical documents about any historical thing written by people who were there at the time uh, and know what they're talking about and don't give any evidence of being uh, dishonest people or have anything to gain by being dishonest, we pretty much are stuck with believing what they say unless unless someone can bring up, you know, some something against them, which means the, the burden of proof rests on whoever wants to say, no, these guys are liars. These guys can't be trusted. Uh, and so uh, that's what I was looking for. Uh, we didn't see anything like that. Instead of any evidence for anything, what Max has presented is a list of things he doesn't believe in, things that some Christians believe, many Christians believe, some of them I actually believe, but the question is not, you know, are all these things true? The question is, is Jesus true? Is Jesus who he claimed to be? To that, all the evidence that's been presented has been on the side of affirmative. There is historical evidence for it. Uh, certainly, uh, I've heard no uh, alternative explanation for how the tomb of Jesus would have been reasonably empty and never, his body never presented for refutation. Uh, I mean, there's Frankly, uh, you know, the evidence is, is pretty strong. Most historians have found it. So I, actually many atheists, I could name at least four or five off the top of my head, have set out to prove Christianity is not true and have become converted in the process, including C.S. Lewis and Josh McDowell and Lee Strobel, uh, Peter Stoner and others, uh, actual atheists who were trying to specifically prove Christianity is not true. And by doing something which I suspect Max has not had the occasion to do, and that is to spend concentrated effort looking at the evidence objectively. And frankly, quite a few of them, and not unintelligent men, uh, have said, well, I guess I can't say it's not true anymore. And uh, that's the position that I take. I don't think anyone can say that it's not true. And when you have some evidence for one view and no evidence for the other, then by Richard Dawkins' uh, you know, rule of skepticism, if someone says something is true, as when Max said Christianity is not true because atheism is, Dawkins says, well, if someone says that, ask them what the evidence is for that. And we've not heard any evidence. We've only heard what sounds like um, a longer list of things that Max doesn't believe that some Christians do believe. That's, uh, that's not quite the same thing as evidence. Now, of course, he can't give any because there is no evidence against the Christian uh, story uh, in the Gospels. Their uh, scientists can say that miracles can't happen, and therefore we can't trust the Gospels, but they haven't proven that miracles can't happen. I'd like to see some evidence of that. Uh, they, they don't believe there's a God to raise Jesus from the dead. I'd like to see some evidence for that if there is some to, uh, to present. None has been presented. Uh, and all that Max has done is ventilated, really, some ridicule toward beliefs that some Christians have historically believed and some of which I actually believe too, but they're not really on, uh, under debate today. Um, and that's not the same thing as presenting evidence. It's not even the same thing as presenting arguments. It's, it's, uh, it's simply stating opinions. And that's all I've heard 
today from Max. There may be something more he could offer on another occasion, but he hasn't presented that tonight. All right. Thank you, Steve. Um, Max, there's five minutes there if you have a response. I'll just say some, some Christians believe those certain things uh, because they're in the Bible. And that's that's the source that I attempted to analyze and attempted to to honestly and sincerely go through. Again, just making a timeline of what the accounts, the historical accounts, scriptural accounts, whatever you want to call them, just making a timeline and seeing if that timeline is feasible or not. And and it's it's not. So let's get to questions. All right. Let's get those super chats flowing. Well, we'll get into those super chats then, shall we? So um as I've explained uh, to the gentleman uh, before the debate started, and I'll explain so our audience understands how I like to work it, this is not a rule of modern day debate. I just find it to be fair. Um, question is specifically directed to an individual. Um, the opponent can comment on it, but I like the last word to come from um, the person who the question was for. So you guys can discuss it if you want, but um, the, the final play comes from the person who the question was meant for. With that, our first super chat, BTF Wayne, $5. Jesus wasn't the only one to rise that weekend. So did many undead? Why are there no officially documented zombie uprisings in the first century scholars? Uh, so this sounds like it's a question for Steve. Yes, it is, apparently. Yeah, well, the Bible doesn't say that very many people rose from the dead. The Bible says some did when Jesus rose. And uh, these would be people who were not zombies. They were people like Lazarus who had previously risen from the dead. That, he's not one of that many, but there were people there in the same class. Uh, there are three people we know of that Jesus raised from the dead, all of them recently dead in, in Scripture. As far as I know, the others whose names are not given to us uh, were raised also uh, in pretty much the same way. They were not long dead. The, the Bible doesn't, uh, actually it's Matthew who tells us this, to say there's no record of it, well, that, that's, that's begging the question. I think Matthew is a record of it. So, uh, and there's many historical events that are only mentioned in one historical record, frankly, because too many things happen for anyone to record all of them. But all of, actually, all of the Gospels record Jesus raising some dead. That particular case is not given, but then the case of Lazarus is only given in John and not in the other Gospels. That, that the Gospels have to be selective uh, with their with their parchments. Uh, you know, because they have like years of material they could record if they had unlimited time and, and parchment. But they, they select what they think is important to mention. But certainly there's nothing about that particular event that you're referring to, which is in Matthew 28, 50 and 51 and so forth. Um, there's nothing about that event that's outstandingly different than the other cases of, of people who rose from the dead in Jesus' ministry. All right. Thank you. Um... Yeah, so unless you want to say something there, Max, I'm going to the next question. Uh, Go for it. Next question. Uh, Gaius Husky, 499. Um, the 9-11 hijackers martyred themselves for their beliefs. Does that make their beliefs true? Um, they say, no, it does not. Do you agree, disagree, Steve? Uh, well, pe people can die for any ridiculous belief. I, I didn't argue that the Christians died for their beliefs. I said they died for their witness, for their testimony. A testimony is different than a belief. If you're in court and you say, well, I heard somewhere that this happened, they'll say that's hearsay. We can't accept that in court. They want to know what you saw because they figure that you might be deceived by somebody else's words, but you and you might even be deceived by your own eyes, but it's much less likely. If you saw something yourself and you can say, yeah, I was there. That's what happened. I saw it. That is your testimony. That's your witness. That's different than your beliefs. Now, Muslims die for their beliefs all the time. So do, frankly, so do Christians and Jehovah's Witnesses and and uh, actually uh, Buddhists and, and Hindus have often known to die for their beliefs. Uh, no, it doesn't mean their beliefs are true. But then, as I said, pe people can believe almost any nonsensical thing so much that they'll die for it. The question is, will people die for a lie that they know to be a lie? And we know of no historical cases of anyone who did that. Joseph Smith, he knew it was a lie and he died for it. He didn't want to die. He was he was murdered in prison and he was trying to escape. Yeah, he didn't want to be a martyr. All right. Next question um, from Jay Riviera, three four five sends a nine ninety nine. He says, or they say, um, 
it is very telling that Matthew, who wrote over 40 years after Jesus, made up events like census to gain to get Jesus in Bethlehem, Herod slaughtering newborns just to make it appear prophecy is being fulfilled. I feel that one's targeted towards you as well again, Steve. No problem. Well, you said that Matthew made those things up, but you haven't demonstrated that he did. Uh, historians have not concluded that he made those things up. The, the slaughter of the infants by Herod is very characteristic of Herod's behavior that is known from the secular historians. He was a murderous man. He killed lots of innocent people, including his own sons. Now, that, that story didn't have to be made up to explain Jeremiah chapter thir uh, 31, verse, uh, I think it's verse 15, where it talks about Rachel's weeping in her grave. In fact, reading that, that prophecy, you wouldn't assume that it had anything to do with that kind of an event. It's just that Matthew, recording that event as a historical fact, saw uh, sort of a verbal similarity to that in the prophecy, so he, he brought that up. As far as making up the census, there were many censuses, and uh, historians have different opinions about that particular census and its date. Um, if you can show beyond question that no census occurred in the year 6 BC, uh, I'll be interested, although I've actually studied that out, and I don't think historians have any proof of that at all. All right. Our next super chat reads more like a comment, so I'll allow you guys both an opportunity to respond to it here. Uh, uh, the same viewer, J. Riviera, 345, sends another 999. If you meet someone who sometimes tells you things that are true, sometimes false, and sometimes tells you things that you can't verify, how likely are you to trust this person? This is the Bible. Um, do either of you have a comment to... Uh, I'll, I'll throw in on that. Sure. <clears throat> so just because... Uh, a story or a storybook or an element of a story refers back to historical things like a census or uh, refers back to things like, uh, uh, you know, like a Passover celebration happening at a time and a place. That doesn't make the rest of the story true. Just the same way that sometimes someone who tells you, someone who you know to be sometimes honest and sometimes dishonest, that, I mean, that's going to taint the source a little bit and so you're going to want to take that with a grain of salt uh and so just because the bible might reference certain historical things which are verifiable realities it doesn't make the rest of the stories true in the same way anytime the bible provides a historical thing or historical fact like a lineage or, a, or an ancestry family tree thing that goes against the evident facts then it, it, it's going to be a, a good tick in the other direction that that source is misinformed at, at least. Okay, yeah, it's, it's possible for historical sources to be misinformed. But when they tell you what they saw and heard uh, with their own eyes and spending years in proximity with a person, hearing him speak and watching him do his thing, uh, they could be lying, but you'd have to have a reason for thinking they're lying, I would think. I mean, if, if you were doubtful of everything anyone told you, uh, you couldn't believe anything you ever hear. And maybe you don't, but I don't think infinite skepticism is called for. Uh, Dawkins said we should wonder what evidence they have. And when we see the evidence, we should, of course, evaluate that. That's what I have done. To me, the evidence is that the uh, writers of the Gospels, now, now the, the questioner said that's what the Bible is. Well, some parts of the Bible are hearsay. There's no question about that. Not, not all parts of the Bible were written by eyewitnesses. The Gospels, however, are written by, in three cases, eyewitnesses, and in one case, somebody who traveled with the eyewitnesses and knew their stories well. That was Luke, of course. But the, the point here is uh, to say, well, just because something he said is true doesn't mean the whole thing is true. True, a person might write uh, a fiction, historical novel that has some historical facts woven into a fictional story. But if that's what they're writing, they kind of expect their reader to be aware of that. When somebody writes what they claim to be a historical account, then if we want to say, and let's say it's about things they actually know about because they were in the position to know, uh, well, then to say that we would question their story would seem to be gratuitous. All right. Our next super chat um, from Charles Lanier, 999. Uh, there's a word in this I'm going to have a trouble with, and it's a question for Max. So bear with me. Max, is it possible that your young earth like uh, hermeneutics, hermeneutics. Hermeneutics, okay, yeah. of the scripture is what is keeping you from coming to faith? Actually, it's a thing that led me out of faith. Uh, I, I tested the scriptures as the scriptures say to do. 
I set out to show that that Jesus was who he said he was and that Jesus was who the scripture, the gospel writers said he was. And I did that, tracing the, the prophecy about fulfilling the, the King David line and all that. And I, I literally made just a timeline. And the timeline just did not jive up with the facts. And I grew up in a situation, an environment where I was raised young earth creationist. Okay, I had, I mean, like the uh, answers in Genesis, that kind of stuff. So that's the kind of Christianity, the, the faith tradition I grew up in. And so when I got out of that bubble and I started to be able to test those things, those claims made by that branch of Christianity, I was like, wow. My branch of Christianity isn't correct, and there are so many other branches of Christianity. They all disagree about stuff. I mean, it was the beginning of the unraveling for me of Christianity. So I suppose, you know, if you were to unravel that or re-ravel that unraveling uh, and go back and prove that <clears throat> the earth is 6,000 years old and that we all came from the survivors of a global flood and there's evidence for that flood and all that stuff, uh, yeah, I, I, I would definitely... That would give me pause for sure. I could, I mean, it's, it's uncomfortable becoming atheist, especially when you're in a, in a family that's as religious as mine. I mean, Steve, you, you cited that, you know, people were killed or, or persecuted because of their witness or, or belief or testimony. I mean, I've not been killed or, or beaten or anything like that, but it's caused me some grief in my life to, to, to share my uh, journey with, members of my family who are deeply, deeply religious, so. Yeah, I'd like to say something about that, that too. I think what Max just shared with us, I was going to bring up anyway, because I knew this about him. He came from a very religious, evangelical, conservative family, which means he had only heard of one way of reading Genesis 1 through 11. He'd only heard of one literalistic way of taking certain things in the Bible. And when he applied that, he found it very difficult to find to be correct. Uh, and therefore he rejected Christianity. Now, what I'm saying is there are many people who reject that literalistic thing. Uh, the same thing, it would not see it the way that Max's parents saw it. Uh, but And they've rejected that literalistic approach, but they haven't thrown the baby out with the bathwater because the evidence for Christ is on a very different level than the evidence for most other stories in the Bible. Not that they aren't true, but, but the, as far as the weight of the evidence is uh, much more confirmed for the story of Christ in the Gospels. I mean, from secular evidence, from Roman historians, Suetonius and, and Tacitus, from Josephus, and the, even, even the Talmud, which is hostile toward Jesus, the Jews actually confirm many of the things that he did. They just say that his miracles were sorcery and things like that, so we get their slant. But, but the fact is they inadvertently, uh, you know, demonstrate that they cannot deny that he did supernatural things. They just had to call them sorcery. So, in other words, we have hostile witnesses, probably ambivalent witnesses, and we have Christian witnesses, and they all give the same story. All, all the basic facts of Jesus' life can be confirmed from, I have about a dozen sources, including about half of them are in the Bible today, and uh, and about half of them are not. They're not Christian. So, um, yeah, I'm, so in other words, the evidence for Christ is very, very much different on a very different level than the evidence for most of the other stories in the Bible, which does not, to my mind, mean the other stories are not true. I believe most of the stories in the Bible are, are in fact, true. But, um, but I mean, if I even if I didn't, I have to look at the Gospels through a, a very much more uh, critical lens because they make more claims. And I find if I look at the evidence outside of them, that confirms them. I'd say, well, these are about the best confirmed uh, ancient histories that we have on record anyway. In fact, there's more in the Gospels about Jesus' life than the historians have written about Tiberius, who was the Caesar during, during Jesus' ministry. Jesus was an obs obscure Galilean uh, who never left his country, and he was a peasant teacher, and Tiberius was the emperor, and we actually have more written about him by people close to him than we have about Tiberius. So we have pretty good records of Anything to add, Max, or are we good to carry on? I mean, it's, uh, but no, I'm, I, I, I'm just not impressed with the kind of, I'm not, it's not that I'm not impressed with the kind of evidence presented. I'm just unimpressed with the content presented. And that's to say I'm unimpressed because it, uh, when you try to test the content and the narrative presented in that evidence, 
it just doesn't add up all right um so just to give you guys uh some heads up because i've been here before um and, and you guys haven't um we're already about halfway through our q a session and have like answered five questions and there's probably 50 or so on deck um so i know you guys love the topic and you could just go on forever uh, but if we can keep the answers a little bit more succinct uh we can satisfy all of these questions okay um, yes <laughs> thanks max uh next question vtf wayne two dollars genesis one how did we have days before we had a son sounds like it's for steve well, we didn't have days before there was a turning earth and a source of light. Um, I mean, Genesis doesn't claim that there was uh, there were days before there was a rotation of day and night. Uh, you may not believe that there's any other source of light that could have provided this than the sun, and that's up to you. You you, you can believe that if you want to. Okay, Megan Marie, nine ninety nine. Thank you, Megan. If Christianity was true, why does God make the truth? quotations so unclear many denominations have different views on what is true in christianity why doesn't god just clear things up if he is all powerful i'll, I'll let take, steve take that one i'm gonna i'll be right back yep okay i would say because god is not uh, a trivialist the things that christians disagree about are relatively trivial compared to the things that are clear uh who jesus is what he wants from us uh, what he did, uh, what his position is, these things are not ambiguous. Every every book of the New Testament and all the Gospels and all Christians agree about those. Uh, now, that Christians like to get into the nuts and bolts of little questionable things that God didn't bother to talk about because he didn't think they were important enough to do so, that's not his fault. That's ours. I mean, I think that if Christians did what the early Christians did and just affirmed the basic truths of Christianity that they all agree on, we wouldn't have all these doctrines. We wouldn't have all these churches. All right. Um, I don't know if Max can hear us where he went, uh, but I'm pretty sure this next one is more directed at you. Anyways, Steve, from Ozean Talks, $5. I didn't rule out supernaturalism prior to investigation. I investigated and found zero evidence sufficient to demonstrate anything is supernatural. Well, uh, apparently historical records and uh, eyewitness testimony is discounted in your exploration, and that's your business. It would suppose that that makes me think that your whole exploration took place within a naturalistic worldview. Uh, although you said you were open, uh, the truth is that most historical events, in fact, all, virtually all historical events that happened before I was born, I can only know about by historical records and, and by the testimony of people who were there. Uh, there certainly is no lack of evidence of that kind. Uh, if if what you're saying is there's not enough evidence to convince you that those records are reliable. Well, then I'd like to know what kind of negative evidence you found, or if you simply are slanted against them because they don't uh, follow the naturalistic worldview that you favor. Same person, Charles Lanier, 999. There's a difference between believing it's true and believing it's true in the way that it was written to be understood. Genesis, as a more cosmic temple inauguration, makes more sense of Scripture. Well, this is this is coming from a person that, such as I mentioned, that person I believe is probably a Christian. I don't know who they are, but but they are saying that Genesis one is not intended to be taken literally. It's it's a cosmic temple interpretation. That's one of several ways that Christians understand that differently than the literal way. And you know, to, to you know, for them to do that removes most of the ammunition that that uh, Max came here prepared with. And therefore, he wants to say, no, you have to take it literally or and it has to be, you know, so so I can make it ridiculous. Uh, but actually, you don't have to take it literally. Uh, and many people don't. And th that questioner is one who apparently does. I don't accept his view. By the way. I don't accept that questioner's view. But there are many views that I certainly I certainly don't take it literally either. In fact, it makes no sense if you take it literally. The problem arises is that then you create this uh, rabbit hole of which parts of Scripture can you take literally and which parts do you not have to take literally? Do you have to take the resurrection part literal? Do you have to take the creation or Noah's flood account literal? And it's very evident from internal analysis within the New Testament authors that they certainly took it literal. And so why shouldn't we? And when we do take it literal, 
we can test the claims that it makes and we see that it's in steve's words totally ridiculous in my words uh inaccurate <laughs> to say the least okay next question pointless pappy 999 how is self-deletion better than killing your son not really well, sure who that's directed to. I feel like it's Steve. I think he's he's trying to address that to me because I said that uh, the death of Christ is not represented in Scripture as child child sacrifice, but God coming Himself and dying in our place. Uh, that a person might die to save other lives. How is that different than offering your own child as a sacrifice? I think it's worlds different. If a man falls on a hand grenade to save his friends who are standing around, that's a very admirable thing. If, on the other hand, he takes his son and, and throws him on a hand grenade, that's a very different thing. Okay. I think that I, that's addressed in John 3, 16. Uh, For God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. It's a very clear indicator that God sent his son to, to be sacrificed. Okay, my final point on that is John, also two chapters earlier, said that that son was God in the flesh. All right. Uh, next Super chat from Pointless Poppy again, another 999. The idea that God sacrificed himself rather than his son does not make it right. How is literal killing of a body do anything to solve the problem of our sins? Well, since that's a theological question, it's probably to me. And the fact is that uh, I'm not sure that I know how that does. Christians have given lots of different ideas. The, there's like five different views of the atonement, which is the question you're asking. How is it? that the death of Christ would have any impact on the sins of man. Like I said, theologians have offered five very different answers to that question. I don't know which one is right. I've never felt like I needed to know which one is right. As long as God knows which one is right, that's good enough for me. It is. You'll hear Steve say that a lot, by the way. As long as God knows is right, it's good enough for me. It's not good enough for me. I have much more curiosity. I agree with him. He has more curiosity than I do. Yeah. Okay. Ozean Talk sends $5. How do you know George Washington crossed the Delaware River on December 25th, 1776? He also says here that he does an after show on a channel called Matters Now, including tonight. So um, I'm familiar with this channel. Uh, well, I'm very familiar with this channel. I'm, I'm a little bit part of the channel there. And uh, they always do an after show after modern day debate. Um, the debaters are always welcome. In fact, uh, when the debaters show up over there, it's really a lot of fun. Um, if you guys want that link later, I can give it to you. But um, anyone watching this debate right now when it's Send over? Me the link. Uh, yeah, well, I'll do it later in the um, when we're done and we're private there. Um, but anyone else here can also go and uh, check out Matters Now after the debate is closed and there'll be an after show to discuss the debate itself. Um, so yeah, how do you know that George Washington crossed the Delaware River on December 25th, 1776? I think that's directly to Max. It's easy I believe it is as well. I mean, uh, how do I know? It, it just there's 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 a painting of it for one thing. I don't. I I personally don't know the date because I just haven't investigated American history that much. It's human history is much less inspiring and interesting to me than geological history or, or cosmological history. Uh, human history is just a drop in the bucket compared to that. I'm not dismissing your question. I'm just saying I personally. I, I would I read several historical books. I mean, you could you could keep investigating that. You could keep going to, you know, interviewing people who have researched the topic a lot. Uh, I mean, at, at some point, I would. I'm not a historian and I'm not an archaeologist, but there are ways to go about doing that. None of which rely on God, by the way, to try to explain whether George Washington crossed the Delaware River. And, and likewise, I wouldn't rely on God to explain that either. But I think, um, I guess what I'd wonder, Max, though, if somebody asked you what date it was, and you knew that date, and you knew that all the historians gave the same date, and no historian ever gave a contrary date, would you feel that you could not answer their question? If somebody asked you that, whether that happened in the life of George Washington or not, oh. and you knew that every historical source says that it did, and no historical source says that it did not, would you be prepared to give that as, as an answer of what happened? Uh, yeah, I'd be, I'd be inclined to. What I'd then have to do is the 
historical sources which say that it accounts with other things in history. For instance, George Washington was, uh, you know, fighting against the British when he crossed the Delaware River. Is it true that the British really occupied New England in the 1770s? Well, I could go and I could try to dig up, you know, British muskets or like British uniforms or something like that. Like there are ways to, to figure that out, uh, you know, with physical evidence. All right. Yep. Megan Marie sends another four ninety nine. God so loved the world that he, that it created humans. Then was like, man, this was a bad idea. Let me <laughs> just kill them all. Uh, not a god to be worshipped, in my opinion. That's an emotional I'm, argument, but I do tend to agree. I'm, I do. I would agree with you. It is an emotional argument, and uh, I'm more interested in evidential arguments. Okay. Um, Sergeant Taz sends nine ninety nine. It's their first ever super chat. Welcome to the party, Sergeant. Um, Max's tome line dispute could be explained in two pet dot three eight. I hope those letters and words made sense to you folks. Um, but beloved, be not ignorant ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Yeah, that that illegible part is Second uh, Peter three eight. Okay, uh, forgive me. It's a quotation from Scripture. Yeah, so the person is saying, you know, a day to the Lord is like a thousand years, and therefore the six days of creation could be thousands of years, which of course would not satisfy any geologist, uh, you know, because uh, six thousand years is no better than six years. Uh, when you're discussing this with an old earth advocate who believes in the earth is 4.5 billion years old. So, I mean, to say a day to the Lord is like a thousand years, it, it, it does not translate into a year to the Lord is 365 years, uh, because that's how it is. And then even that, I'm afraid, probably would not work out uh, to Max's satisfaction with the dates that we're talking about. Steve, you said that uh, you use Second Peter three five, correct? Three eight mm -hmm. or three eight, right? So Second Peter three five actually discusses how once the world was destroyed by water, but soon it would be destroyed by fire. So it actually does the same scripture you're citing references the 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 reality, the purported reality of the flood. I mean, these people believe the flood happened, and there's, there's no, no evidence question. that it did. There's no question that they believe that. That's right. Right. I turn my camera back on. Hopefully that doesn't crashes here yeah okay um manga fan dan five dollars if jesus resurrected couldn't that be proof more so that he has wolverines or deadpool's healing power rather than being the almighty creator well if we had only his resurrection with no context i mean like max was saying the crossing of the delaware by george washington has historical context uh, one thing that Bible does do very nicely is to show the historical context of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And, uh, you know, the fact that, for example, the Jews were looking for somebody who fulfilled prophecy, and he did. Uh, he he was not a Wolverine-type person. He was actually a person who healed the sick and did wonderful things for people. No one ever found a malicious or uh, vicious thing in his life. Um, you know, and then he said, yeah, I'm going to die. They're going to kill me. I'm going to die by the hands of wicked men, but then I'll rise again because, you know, that's what's going to happen. And then he did. Now, that puts his resurrection in a very different setting than, than no setting at all. If, if there's no setting at all, then maybe we could talk about, well, maybe, you know, people are thought to resurrect all the time, or maybe there's, a, you know, zombies or werewolves or vampires. Who knows? Yeah, well, well, you could say that if you don't know anything about the setting, but that's why I recommend knowing something more about what is being said okay um experiments and probiotics sends ten dollars the only thing that really matters in this debate is whether mind body dualism is true if mind body dualism is false then no soul equals no afterlife equals no heaven equals no hell equals no god hashtag subtle salmon well i don't that's think... a big very... go ahead okay, go ahead, go ahead Max, i was gonna say that's right. a very good point because it's sort of one of the foundational tenets of Christianity is that we are souls, we are spirits, right? And I would say that, well, humans as animals are certainly, most of our cognition powers occurs in our brain. 
uh, anybody who spent any time with a microscope looking at life forms and organisms, you know, very, very tiny, who don't have a brain, they definitely exhibit some sort of consciousness. Uh, other animals that also don't have a brain, like a jellyfish, for instance, it definitely exhibits some sort of consciousness. So consciousness, I would say, this is my position, just from what I've observed, does not necessarily appear to be limited just to a brain, but it does appear to be limited to life because because i can't really see a rock willing itself to you know roll in one way or another maybe it does but i mean it has no it has no outward signs of doing that but i do see life forms ap appearing to have some kind of awareness or mechanism for awareness to grow towards the sun or what have you i don't think it's spiritual i don't think it's i don't think there's any any non-material force that interacts with that i think it, it it's probably has something to do with the nature of quantum mechanics and the interactions with particles and neuroceptors and stuff like that. Uh, it, uh, consciousness is probably an emergent property. Um, and, and that's what the science seems to indicate the more that we learn about it. Yeah, I'd like to say I, I agree that subhuman life has consciousness of a sort. <laughs> that's subhuman, which is other human. Yeah, yeah we, we refer to these as instincts. Uh, when a kangaroo is born, it's a it's a an embryo, and yet it instinctively climbs through its mother's hair into the pouch where it'll be nurtured until it's older. It doesn't it, it didn't learn that anywhere. That's that's an instinct built in. Um, now, if we could explain all human behavior in terms of instincts that are built in, that'd be interesting because then my belief in God is an instinct, and Max's belief in atheism is an instinct, and yet we're both of the same species. Uh, so it doesn't seem to be built in instinct in our species to do the same thing or think the same thing. We seem to have free will and uh, rational thought processes. I want to just say the idea that the soul-body dualism is at the core of the belief in immortality is not actually biblically true. At the core of biblical uh, immortality is the belief in the resurrection. Uh, the Bible says our bodies are sown into the ground as mortal but we're raised from the ground immortal. This is, has nothing to do with heaven. It has nothing to do with the soul per se. It has to do with the body. And the immortality of the believer in the Bible is associated with the resurrection of the body, not, not a soul-body dualism. Though I do believe in a soul-body dualism. I'm just saying that's not what immortality is based on in the Bible. Okay, moving on. Ozian Talks, $2. Steve, debate, question mark? Christianity versus naturalistic atheism. Uh, I believe it's a I challenge all, to they're Steve. They're asking for a debate. He's hard to get oh. a hold of. Although, oh. call the radio program. Plug your radio show, Steve. Yeah, I have a radio show that's on every day, an hour a day on stations all over the country. And uh, it's just open mic, open question and answer, open phone line. Okay. And people um, call I always it. ask at the end of the uh, Q&A uh, about your guys', um, like where people can find you online so we'll get those specifics um out on the, the air here so everyone can reach out to you um so you're saying um if ozian wants to speak to you he can reach you at your your radio station he certainly can yeah. okay um charles langer another 499 great job steve way to embody ephesians 6 god bless brother thank you um megan marie again 499 um just like we have outgrown believing in Norse gods, so too will we outgrow religion. That's a statement of faith. It's a trend. It's a statement of faith. Christianity that the is a trend that's been observed will continue. Actually, Christianity is growing at a much ra more rapid rate in the world today than it ever was before, especially in the global South and Asia. In some parts of the world, Christianity is advancing at a speed four times the population growth of the continent that it's growing on. And so to say that uh, Christianity is near its end, I think you're very provincial. You must be only looking at America and Europe, but there's other parts of the world that are not Europe and America. Some are more reasonable. Michael Dang Dangelo, 10 Australian dollars, their first two super chat. Christians that reject the young earth are handicapped in these arguments. Just accept the fact that it is a reject of pseudoscience. Trust me, bro. It's millions on. It's millions on years old. Which it gets it will explain. 
that's directed to me, I think. And I, I just uh, forgive me if I don't trust you, bro. Mm -hmm. I, I don't trust you just because they say what their opinion is. See, I'll listen to it and I'll listen to any evidence you want to give. But trust me, bro, it just doesn't work with me. I need evidence. Yeah, that comment was barely literate. Um, Steve, if your argument is we cannot prove God doesn't exist, therefore he is, then I ask, can you prove my God? S Slinesh didn't create all, didn't create us all. No, and I'm not interested in, in, in uh, proving that. I follow Jesus, you see, and, and my argument is that Jesus is authentic. Jesus is who he claimed to be. And if he is, then he knows more about God than any of us do. And so I believe in the God he believed in. All right. Sneaky Jake, nine, $10. Max, what evidence do you have to suggest that a wholly literal, literal interpretation of Genesis is correct? A approximate or fundamental to Christianity's truth claim? So the question is whether a wholly literal interpretation of Genesis is central to Christianity's claim. Mm -hmm. Right. So Steve, in fact, a, a lot of Christian theologians, I mean, most of them, they all have to sort of add their own thing. They all have to sort of add their own explanation or appendicize of, of how to explain things in the Bible, because taken at face value, the Bible doesn't make sense. The same theologians, they claim, oh, the Bible must make sense. You just have to know how to interpret it correctly. Uh, here, I have a line, I think, from Steve's statement of faith where he says, uh, ah, yes, the Jewish and Christian scriptures of the Old and New Testament are given by inspiration of God and are thus, when properly understood and applied, profitable and authoritative to the disciple in, in all things. Properly understood and applied. Gee, where else have we heard that language before? Uh, here's, here's a line. Uh, the... Right. Okay. So, okay. So properly understood to be applied. We believe that the Bible to be the word of God, as far as it is translated correctly. That's the eighth that's article perfect. of faith from the Mormon church. Yeah, so, I mean, ev every theologian, every, everybody has to sort of, you can't just take it at its own face value because when you do that, as I did, it doesn't make sense. Everybody has to appendicize. That's why it's called apologetics. You have to apologize for the stuff when you read it at its face value, that makes no sense. You have to explain it away. Let me which makes it pretty weak. Apologetics does not come from the word apologize. It's apology in the Greek, which means a defense. The presentation of a defense has nothing to do with apologies. Um, you know, the, the thing is that to say that a person needs to understand an ancient document written in another culture, according to the conventions of language and, and literature of that time, is simply to show yourself to be an educated person. Uh, not only the Bible, anything written by the ancient Assyrians or the Sumerians or the Babylonians or the, even the Greeks or the Romans, you can't understand them unless you apply proper understanding uh, hermeneutics. Really, you have, to, you have to know their language. You have to know their idioms. You have to know their presuppositions and so forth. And that's the job of scholars. Now, I, I'm not a great scholar, but I am a scholar. That's all. I've done nothing but study the Bible, and I have studied it as one following those rules. And, and as such, I've actually changed my mind because I used to be uh, in, very much like your parents. I used to be a, a Baptist. I used to be a fundamentalist. I used to be all those things. And uh, it's my own study of the scripture and my getting to understand actually those Jewish idioms and those, those, uh, those different ways of expressing. I mean, if you took the Psalms the same way you took the book of First Kings, you'd be a fool. Psalms are poetry. In fact, most of the prophets are written in poetry. If, if you take, uh, you know, the book of Joshua, the way you take one of the parables of Jesus in Matthew, then you're missing the point. Yeah, to properly understand is absolutely necessary when you're reading ancient documents that you're not specially trained in. But the people who are trained in it, they fortunately have a, a, a leg up on the ability to do just that. And there are literally thousands of scholars who have spent their whole lives uh, looking at those documents in that way, and they don't all reach the same conclusions, but uh, and and there's reasons for that because I think when you're in the other room, someone asked why would God not be more clear on things. I said, well, God doesn't is not obligated to be clear on trivial things that He doesn't care if we know about. He's very clear on the things He wants us to know about, and 
Those are the how do you know that? How do you know that? Well, how do you know God's not? I mean, how do you know that? Because of the products of his revelation. He didn't he didn't tell us clearly things that are not important. He told us the one thing that is important, and that's Jesus. And he made that very clear. So well, I think that the origin of the world is a pretty important topic. And what he tells us about it runs completely contrary to all the evidence that we find in that same well, world. He doesn't, give, he doesn't give a scientific description of the origin of the world, but he does tell us that he's the creator. That's the only important thing we need to know. We might be curious about many other things. I'm sure people throughout history have been curious about things that we no longer are curious about. But the point is, what God thinks is important is what a Christian is concerned about, that God is the creator whether he did it 4.5 billion years ago or 6,000 or 10,000 or however many years ago is irrelevant because I wasn't around then. I'm living in the world that I was born into with the circumstances that God has brought to pass prior to my being here. I don't care how long ago he did it. You can have the last word on this one, Max. The question was for you. Well, I mean, I do care about how he did it, how because he, how the Bible, how Christianity, the scriptures, the historical documents, whatever you want to call it, how they describe God doing it, uh, it just, we could test that. If what we tested showed that there was a global flood and that all people originated from, uh, you know, eight individuals from Noah and that there was a Tower of Babel and then everybody was scattered and that languages developed this way, fossil evidence, if all of this pointed in that direction, it would be pretty convincing. It doesn't do that. It provides the exact opposite of, of what that story purports. And it, I mean, it just undermines the whole thing. It just, it just from the beginning, from the get-go, just make a timeline. It completely eradicates at least the narrative of Christianity. And if the narrative of Christianity is broken, then the teachings of Christianity are probably going to be broken as well. Um, Dan Shire, 999. Steve, you claim that proving Christianity is true simply requires proving Jesus was who he claimed to be. Who did Jesus claim to be? And what is your evidence that his claim is true? Well, uh, he claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed to be uh, the manifestation of the Father. Uh, he said that if you've seen him, you've seen the Father, for example. He claimed to be the Messiah. That The reason I know that's true is not only because he was a truthful man, but because he fulfilled the prophecies that described the Messiah. And no one ever him. So that, that'd be my, my reason for believing he is who he said he is. Steve, or Kaiju, $5, their first ever Super Chat today. Steve, who is the correct eyewitness to the story? Luke specifically says the disciples stayed in Jerusalem. Matthew says they went to Galilee. Who's right? Both. Both. They were in Jerusalem when Jesus rose. He appeared to them over the first week. Then he made an appointment to meet them. As you can read in most of the Gospels, he made an appointment to meet them in Galilee. And the Bible records him meeting with them up there at the Sea of Galilee and meeting with a bunch of them on a mountain there and instructing them. Then he went back to Jerusalem and, and, uh, and met them on the uh, Mount of Olives there. There's no contradiction. Um. I'm going to modify this question a little bit just because of the algorithm, um, but I believe it's for Max. Benjamin Smith sends 999 their first super chat as well for Modern Day Debate. Why is the problem of evil only a problem for theists? If the world were really that bad, wouldn't all atheists just self-terminate? No, no, because the problem of evil it's 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 a it's a problem where you have to i mean it just gets into moral relativism i believe that the law of causality cause and effect is a more effective argument than the law of good and evil meaning if i do something that is bad if i uh rob a rob a, a candy store right that's bad why is it bad it's bad because society would break if everybody tried to rob their candy stores and it, that that's what makes it bad. It's not bad because there's some top-down mechanism from on high, from a supernatural realm saying, this is bad, don't, don't steal. It's bad because when people steal, when people do what we perceive to be evil things, 
it creates a society where not everyone can thrive and flourish. It's, it's sort of a natural selection process that way of how we arrive in our morals. And people screw it up all the time. There are aberrations, different cultures, because they're distributed geographically differently. They have different morals and, and all that stuff. Uh, so, I mean, it's the, the question was, how does a theist answer the problem of evil? I mean, go ask a theist. I'm not, I, I am not one. Okay, I am one. And I would say that the, the Christian has less problem with this, the problem of evil than the atheist does, because the Christian has the scriptures explaining things. And there are, there are dozens of chapters in the Bible that philosophize about the meaning of evil and the purpose of evil. And if a Christian believes the Bible, then they can answer those questions from that source. The atheist problem with the, uh, with the problem of evil is that atheists can't really say why there would be something that we could really call evil. We can talk about things that are inconvenient, things that don't get the results we'd like, but there's nothing really morally evil. For example, suppose uh, we said that raping a child is evil. A Christian can say that because there's a God who made people in his own image and forbids murder. The atheist can't really say that's evil. That's exactly what our ancestors have always done. That is our non-human ancestors. It's the survival of the fittest. You, you take advantage of the weak. And uh, to say it's evil only because it's inconvenient, because if everyone did it, you know, society would be hellish. Well, okay, then, then you're saying evil is whatever is inconvenient. Now, it wasn't very inconvenient for Hitler to kill the Jews, uh, and and yet we would say it was evil, you know? And so I think that to say that there's a category called evil that is a moral category requires something more than just saying, I don't like it, we don't like it, we have agreed it's not right. Well, but why should I believe what you think is right or is right or not? I mean, who who stands above us all and says it's wrong to kill Jews, it's wrong to rape babies, it's wrong to do anything that's morally wrong. But see, an atheist doesn't have anything to root a moral code in. An atheist may be a moral person in the sense that by Christian morality, they may conform to it somewhat. But they, what they lack is a foundation for saying anything exists as an absolute morality that, that we could judge anyone else by or even judge God by. Okay. Do I get a, yeah, a clap you, back on that one? Yeah. yeah, so it's I am not saying that there is a basis for for good or evil because they're again that people have to find them differently throughout time what i'm saying is that we all have to deal with the reality of our actions and what we do or what we don't do and who we save or who we don't save i mean save for many times from each other and so it, it's just it, it's a matter of it's just a matter of i guess utilitarianism Cl close closely associated with utilitarianism meaning that you know just there's uh, you know, the good of the many outweighs the needs of the one. And I would sign myself up in that camp. I, yeah, I would. All right. Um, next question, David Martinez, 999. Max, what is your explanation for the empty tomb and the sudden and sincere conversion of many who were once enemies of Christianity? Yeah, so it's, uh, here, here, here's my interpretation is that when you're in a cult you can believe anything and a group of people who are all say 12 disciples or 12 and some change when they're all following around somebody and and you know de devoted to this person as like their teacher their rabbi you can get some really zany stories and people can work each other up and say that things happened or that they saw things that they did or didn't see and then if you take into account as well the time lag between when those events were to actually have happened, plus when those events were actually recorded, uh, as far as the writing of the Gospels in relation to the empty tomb, you see that the earliest accords, like in Mark, it, it, it just sort of ends. Like, it doesn't really offer an explanation for the empty tomb. The earliest accord, the earliest records of the Gospel of Mark, which is the earliest Gospel. There are also just the idea that it could just be hyperbolized. They, they, they just... Over time, the story got bigger and bigger and bigger. They said that, well, Jesus, our, our teacher can't be just gone and executed and left on the cross to be just to rot, which is how the Romans like to do it. There, there would have to be a lot of other stories and tales that come up around that to sort of save face. Um, and yeah, you could be so convinced of those stories and tales just to save face that you could be willing to die for them. I mean, that's that's historically evident throughout society, even today, unfortunately, with cults. 
So that really is my, my answer to that is that empty tomb or not. I mean, these are the accounts from these people are from just, I mean, cult members. So I don't, I don't take them too seriously, but when I do evaluate them at their face value, they don't make much sense. Okay. My time. Um, if, if you want, but the questions for Max, which means he gets to respond to whatever you say next. Um, oh, and we still got a bunch of super chats to get to here. So it's up to you. Well, let me just say this. He didn't answer the question. Uh, the question was, how do you account for the conversion of so many people who are enemies of Christ? Max just said the people who were converted were in the cult of Christ. Actually, the first 3,000 people converted were Jewish. They were part of the religion that crucified Christ and which hated Christ. And yet they became convinced that he was real. They were not cultists, not Christians anyway. They were anti-Christian cultists. Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, was a very anti-Christian zealot of a religion that was anti-Christian. He did not get converted in a cult. He got converted because of an, an encounter with Jesus, just like many other people did uh, before him. So, you know, the explanation was not really uh, suitable. Also, as far as the empty tomb is concerned, uh, the story of the empty tomb, according to even atheist scholars, can be traced back to about 62 or 63 AD in its earliest form, which Paul quotes in 1 Corinthians 15. And that's two, that's two years after, uh, I'm sorry, I said 62, 32, 32 or 33, which is essentially two or three years after Jesus died. Lots of eyewitnesses will still be around to check that out. Max? And my, my clap back there is that if, if, you, if you consider, if you look at Christian claims and Christian, what they Christians call Christian history, and, and, and you just look it through and you realize that, oh, this is just an early cult of personality, a, a lot of things fall into place. Okay. Next question. Sean666 sends 10 Canadian. How can eyewitness testimony for Jesus be credible when there was five different versions of his death and resurrection? It kind of looks like the writers of Gospels made it all up. That's for Steve. What's well, interesting if they made it up and they're independent, and, and you must be assuming they are independent because if, if they were not independent, they'd be all saying exactly the same things, right? I mean, if they're, if they're writing as a team, they wouldn't disagree with each other on any point. So they are independent witnesses. It's interesting that they all got it right. They all agree that Pontius Pilate crucified Christ, that he died on the cross, that he was seen by many witnesses after his tomb was found empty. Three days later, all four Gospels have that. Now, as far as the details, yeah, there's a lot of details to, to choose from. And, uh, you know, each Gospel writer chose from the pool of details, which were true, and, and gave their own selection. There's no, contra no contradictions on, in them. As, at least as I understand it, I could read all four Gospels without seeing a contradiction there at all. And I, I kind of have made it my study for my whole life. Okay. Robin Page sends $5 for Steve. Do you have any concrete evidence demonstrating the existence of God that doesn't come from the Bible or any religious scriptures? No. Well, I do. I do, but that's not actually our point of debate today. Yeah, I have experience with God, and it's, I don't mean emotional experience. Whenever I say I have experience with God, people say, oh, that's your subjective emotion. No, I'm talking about when God has provided for me in answer to prayer, things that nobody in the world knew about but God. I've had this happen for me for over 50 years. In fact, I live on that. That's how I live. I don't have any uh, guaranteed income, never have. And, uh, and I simply do what Jesus did, basically, and what the apostles did. I just do what uh, the Bible tells us God wants us to do and trust him to provide. For 50 years or more, I've had that experience. Now, of course, you can do anything you want to to say that experience is, is not valid, but you ask me if I have any concrete experience. Yeah, money in the bank, paying my bills month by month. That's pretty concrete. Okay. Uh, we're almost there, gentlemen. Uh, pointless poppy 499 do you believe nicholas cruz testimony that demons told him to shoot up a high school in 2018 if so what should his punishment be i think that's probably for me or or not sounds that, like it's for you yeah okay. you, yeah well i don't know if demons told him to do that or not it's entirely possible because there are people who are demon possessed unfortunately um uh, However, if somebody does something criminal like that, then they should face the same crime uh, and uh, punishment, I should say, as uh, anyone else would. Um, in my opinion, 
if people do have demons telling them to do things, they still are responsible to say no, just like if 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 their friends or their parents or anyone else telling them to do things wrong, they still have to say no. If they follow those instructions, then they are responsible for them and should be punished. Okay, thank you, Steve. Pointless Poppy again, 999. God killing himself is like a father jumping off a cliff to save his son from a grenade. A body dying on a cross does not take away the past, and there is no mention of memories of sin are wiped away. Well, I'm not sure what that's proving. I, I haven't heard any evidence in that. I, you know, God actually does say that the death of Jesus is the means by which our sin problem has been resolved. I said earlier, there are five different views I know of that theologians have held as to how that works. I don't know how it works. The Bible doesn't really explain unambiguously how it works. It's, it's something that we're told is true. And if God said it's true, and if Jesus said it was true, he said he gave us a life of ransom for many. I actually can't think of any reason to disagree with him, and the and the writer of that question hasn't provided any reason to either. All right. Um, we only have a couple super chats left, so right now I'll take the time to um, thank everyone for coming out to Modern Day Debate. This has been a great discussion. Um, both of you gentlemen are an absolute pleasure and a joy. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, Max the Atheist, do you have a social media presence, or can anybody find you somewhere in a given time? Not really. I just uh, the only the only uh, social media I'd like to plug is is, is Steve's show, uh, the Narrow Path. It's on uh, the radio. If you go to the narrowpath dot com, around two p.m. Pacific time, five p.m. Eastern, you can hear it online and then kind of find a way to call in and connect. All right, then Steve, say it one more time. Then where can people find you if they want to speak to oh, you or listen sir. to you? Max does have a media presence because he calls my show, so <laughs> you can you can hear him there. Uh, yeah, my my website is thenarrowpath.com. It's got archives of shows and my lectures on many subjects there. Though I am on eighty something radio stations across the country daily, Monday through Friday, from two to three in the afternoon Pacific time, and people can call uh, during that hour any any weekday, and uh, you can find out how to link to that if you don't have a radio station in your area uh, that carries it at thenarrowpath.com. I, right. I, I got to double tap that because if you're a fan of Modern Day Debate, you're going to be a big fan of Steve's show. It's his show, so he controls the time and the mute button, which I learned early on. But uh, he, I, 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 I really do uh, thank you, Steve, for, for devoting a show to just having an open forum. And, and as long as people are respectful and call in, they, they can do so and, and talk with you and challenge you on things. And it's, it's a real rarity and a real treasure. And I, yeah, everybody should go and listen and check it out. Truth Seeker sends 999. How do you know when the Bible is being literal and when it's being figurative? What specific methodology do you use? Uh, this question doesn't seem to go out to uh, anyone specific, but I feel like it leans more Steve. That's a great question, by the way. Go, it is, go ahead. It, it is a great question. And it's what we were saying earlier that ancient literature has to be uh, understood according to its genre and its conventions of speech and, and uh, literature and so forth. Uh, when you study the Bible, you find there are some things there, for example, parables that sound like true stories, but they're not intended to be understood as true stories. There are, uh, there's poetry. There's metaphors, there's all kinds of things. But you, how do you know? Well, most of the time you can tell if you know enough about the genre. If you're reading historical narrative, usually the genre is going to be pretty literal. That's how history is usually written. But if you're reading poetry, well, then you're going to have to be careful about taking it literally because it's going to be it's going to be metaphorical and hyperbolic and things like that. I mean, the things that, that characterize poetry. Uh, if you're reading epistles, then you're writing a letter that somebody wrote to somebody else. You have to understand it as that. Um, if you're reading a book, The Prophets, well, that's that's the most challenging of all. They are almost always written in poetry. Uh, and then, of course, you have to know something about you know the historical background and so forth. So it, it helps in those cases if you know how Jesus or the apostles interpreted those prophets. That helps a lot. But yeah, sometimes you might not be able to know whether it's uh, literal or not. But most cases, it's not, not a real challenge. All right. And our last super chat from Brian Stevens, $5.00. Uh, for Steve, do you know the moral anti-realism? I encourage you to debate the logical problem of evil. This deals with the impossibility of God and evil. 
Well, I don't know that particular label, but uh, you see, to say that it's impossible for God to exist and evil to exist means that one is assuming that evil doesn't have a purpose that can be good. Just like, uh, you know, if a doctor breaks a bone in order to set it because it had been broken earlier and needed to be set straight, uh, you know, there's a lot of pain involved. The, the patient, if the patient's a child, they have no idea how that could be good. The doctor does. So uh, we don't know for sure that any particular evil is incapable of serving a good purpose. Once we could decide and, or prove that that is the case, then we would really have a serious problem with uh, God and evil. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.